Good morning, and welcome to Veronica Live. We are back. Hey, I'm here with my statesman, John Sallett. Good morning, John. Good morning from the Southcom, or maybe Beachcom, I guess is better. <laughs> Where are you today? <laughs> I, I am here in Panama City this week. So, you are. Uh, yeah, yeah that's, I left the cold of the farm, so okay. I come down to enjoy the warmth of Florida. Okay, well now you'll have to go to lunch with me. Oh my goodness, that's that's great. Well, welcome back. And we've got a big show here this morning. I want to tease our lineup. We've got Chairman Bob White. He represents the Republican Liberty Caucus of all of Florida. And, you know, I recently joined them as their uh, regional director for Northwest Florida. So I'm recruiting people, but I, I love this organization because they actually get in front of legislators and talk about bills and send emails. And it's just, it's wonderful. So we'll talk about what their mission is. So I'm looking forward to hosting him here this morning. And then later, oh my goodness. He was supposed to be on last week, but I was too sick to host him. And uh, his name is J. Michael Waller. He's a former operative for the CIA. He's a counterintelligence expert. He's got a brand new book. It's been out like two weeks called Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. And oh my goodness, that book was very interesting, John. And, so, very, and very timely also. I mean, consider oh my what's, goodness. what's going on in the world and, and, and the political situation in particular. Well, I think it's just very, very political, you know? So so, uh, I don't know. We'll get into it with him. Plus, he's so interesting, and he's met all kinds of characters, like people that you and I know about from the news, you know. And so, oh, my goodness, I can't wait to hear, because he was kind of just a college student, bebopping around. And then <laughs> his, fir his first encounter was with, uh, who was it, the director of the, was it director of CIA, CIA Bill, um, oh, my goodness. What's his name? Uh, I got Casey, it here. Bill Casey. Yes, like yeah. in a church, in a Catholic yeah. church, in a pew. That, that was that was kind of <laughs> weird because I was going to ask, well, do, are, are you Catholic? No, he <laughs> said just, no. He no. He says he is there, Catholic you know? in there because he's like, uh, I'm not going up to communion. But so, anyways, we'll yeah. talk to him. It should be really interesting because he's met it, so very, many people. Very clandestine and spookish, you know, right? Yes, and then... <laughs> the last um, row of the church pew, you know, on the, on the left. <laughs> this doesn't happen to me in church. I just get COVID when I go to church. <laughs> and it was the COVID that kept giving, John. I I was in bed for days, except for when we did our show. I don't even know how I did the show. And then I went back Thursday, and now I'm a walking adult toddler with a double ear infection, sinus infection. So at least I'm human, but I will say it's, it's the COVID that it, it's a tough, tough one this time. So, uh, but much better, much better than last, last show. And we have lots to talk about because it's wag the dog. Now we're dropping missiles over in Iran and Syria. And do we know what we're hitting? And, Oh my gosh! We, oh, we know we we know what we're hitting. That's uh, absolutely no. <laughs> really? Empty, you think? Empty warehouses empty. That's exactly what's going on. We're hitting empty warehouses. Right, right. Because I, I when you go, you know, Biden has been so ridiculous that he has to think about everything. And well, maybe tomorrow I'll go punch the bully. Maybe tomorrow, stand by, bully. So it's taken him what six days. It's so embarrassing. But um, we do have a huge show, and when we come back, we'll be joined by the chairman of the Republican Li Liberty Caucus, and you're here with Veronica on Veronica Live and statesman John Salek. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Veronica Live, and we're here with our first guest this morning, and that is Chairman Bob White. He is the chairman of the Florida Republican Liberty Caucus, and I've recent, recently joined this organization, and we're trying to make a presence here in the panhandle, and so I'm so proud and happy to have Bob on because, Bob, you're a busy guy, so welcome to Veronica Live. Hey, thanks very much for having me. I'm uh, I'm delighted to be joining you this morning. So, so Bob, for people that don't know what the Republican Liberty Caucus is, tell us what our mission is. We uh, we refer to ourselves as the conscience of the Republican Party. Um, we're never afraid to hold the party accountable when necessary, um, and we're never afraid to hold an elected Republican accountable when necessary. Uh, we try to work within the party as much as we possibly can. 
uh, even though we're not officially connected to the party in any way. We're not a Republican club that's you know been chartered by a local Republican executive committee. We're not we're not uh, we're not chartered by the Republican Party of Florida. Our national organization is not does not fall under the RNC uh, in any way, shape, or form. But we do encourage our members to also be members of their local RECs. We want to try to move the party in back in the direction of what we consider its its roots, the Jeffersonian principles of personal liberty, uh, limited government, and free markets. And so everything that we do, uh, the positions that we take. Uh, the candidates that we vet for endorsement, those kinds of things, uh, everything comes back to those three principles, um, which we consider to be uh, the, found, the foundational principles for what the Republican Party really ought to be all about. Well, and, you know, my first experience was a couple weeks ago in Tallahassee with uh, our organization. You had about 140 people that had partnered with uh, Defend, was it Defend, Defend Florida, I think, was there with us. And we were there for two days for lobby days running around. And I loved, Bob, that we got to get in front of legislators. And I actually was in front of them. We had a sheet with 20 bills that, that we supported. And we you know, told them what we thought, highlighted things, and really, we were in their face. So so what were your, I guess you've been doing this all along. This is, I mean, I was so excited because I felt like, you know, I'm, I was making a difference, fighting for something. Well, you were making a difference, and that's, and that's, why, we, that's why we do that every year. It, it's interesting, the way we're organized, we have, we have local chapters uh, at the county level, and those local chapters will get involved in local issues and with local office holders. We tell our local chapters that they're free to make endorsements in whatever city council, county commission, school board races, et cetera, that they want to at that level. And then the, the RLC of Florida, which I chair that, that board and that organization, we are involved at the state level with state issues, and we make endorsements in races where candidates are running for the Florida House or the Florida Senate. Uh, we vet them thoroughly. Uh, before deciding whether or not we're going to endorse them. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the next step in that process after helping them get elected is, is, of course, to have an impact on the legislation that they're pursuing in Tallahassee. So that's a huge part of what we do. And we've been doing it for a long time. I've been the – I'll be – this is my ninth year as chairman of the um, state organization. I chaired my local chapter for 14 years up until uh, just this past May. Um, and so I've been going back and forth to Tallahassee myself – doing lobby days for the last probably 13 or 14 years and it's really grown considerably back in the early days when i was first started doing this we might have 11 or 12 people uh going up there from maybe two or three counties where we had chapters now of course we have we've grown considerably over the last five or six years and we now have chapters in 35 counties so you know last year i think we had 90 people at at, uh, at our lobby days event and then as you said this year defend florida reached out and they wanted to participate with us and so we said well sure come on along because your issues are our issues uh their election integrity issues and so this year as you said we had between 120 and 140 people that were there and uh the difference is incredible when you get that many people and they're traveling in groups of maybe 8 or 10 or 12 or more sometimes uh office to office to office and our goal is to get in front of every Republican member of the House and the Senate, if only to just drop off the package and, and have a few minutes with them to say, these are our priorities uh, for you this year, for this session, and, uh, and, and, and explain, have an opportunity to explain you know, why we believe the things we believe about these different issues. And then, the, and then this is critical. At the end of every legislative session, we then do a scorecard. Uh, we take 20 bills that we consider to be liberty bills, and we grade these legislators, um, you know, how, based on how they voted on these 20 bills, and we publish that. Um, and it's 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 really it's really eye-opening when you take a look at these legislators that are so-called Republicans, and you see that most of them are getting a C or a C minus or maybe a C plus, um, a few B's and very few A's. Uh, I think this past year, last session, I think we had three A's all in the House, no A's in the Senate. Um, but most most of these Republicans are scoring C's or, or C minuses. So there's a lot of work to be done to open their eyes to, you know, to, to what the people really expect them to be doing for us in Tallahassee.
Well, I guess what I was uh, sh- most shocked by was, you know, they didn't know all of these bills. And then I guess you have to have somebody, a senator and a Republican, I mean, a representative to try to move them forward as companions. And I know one of the ones I talked to uh, was involved in election integrity and getting that stamp on a driver's license that says you're not an American because I'm a veteran. I have the veteran stamp. And that's one of the ways to make sure that you know, somebody that's not an American isn't voting in our in our election. And they all lit up when I brought up that bill, you know, and, and they loved it. So it was just amazing that they didn't know every single bill. I guess they're very busy. Um, so so that that bill was important to me. And then the other one that really shocked me, Bob, that I want you to get into was the the right the buying a long gun right now it's 21 after the parkland shooting and trying to get that back down to 18 uh because you know i learned during our two days that once people are elected and go up there you know they aren't all they forget about the second amendment a little bit (laughs) when they're in tallahassee yeah it's um it's a very difficult environment right now especially on the senate side because the the current Senate President uh, Kathleen Pasadomo, she's down in the uh, Collier County, you know, Naples area, and she's very anti Second Amendment. And so she's this is her this is she she serves two sessions. This is her last session. So at the end of this session, uh, she'll be you know she'll be termed out, and there'll be a new Senate President that'll be coming in. And and of course, you were with us when our board met with Senator Albritton. It was incredible. Will be the next Senate president for uh, for two years. He sat down with us for we must have spent forty five minutes or an hour with him, which was great, and had a good discussion with him. And I think he'll be much more pro Second Amendment, hoping he will be. And and so the we won't get we won't get any progress this year uh, out of the legislature simply because of uh, Senator Pasadomo's uh, position. And as the Senate president, she wields tremendous power. Uh, so nobody's going to buck her, but uh, hopefully we'll make some progress, some significant progress next year. Hopefully we'll get that age lowered uh, from 21 back down to 18, where it should be. Um, and then, uh, and then the other issues, of course, that are so important. And uh, there are bills that that we're tracking this year to try to, you know, the red flag part of the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas bill that was passed, that red flag ordinance, um, uh, you know, risk protection uh, ordinances that get, uh, get that people get hammered with, where their guns get comp- their firearms get confiscated without them even knowing that it's somebody has filed a complaint against them, and then they have to go into court to try to, to try to prove their innocence. Basically, instead of you know instead of being innocent until proven guilty, they come and take your firearms. You have no idea that somebody's made a complaint against you, and then you have to go into court to try to get them back. And um, and and if you can't afford an attorney, they will not appoint one for you uh, because they've classified it as a civil, not a criminal. So there's legislation this year that would that would at least provide um, that if you have to go into court and can't afford an attorney, the state will pay for one for you because it can be very expensive to go through that process. Uh, we're talking thousands of dollars, ten, twenty thousand uh, dollars in some jurisdictions, uh, even more. So it's very difficult. So that's a that's a very important uh, piece of legislation. And then uh, we we do have a bill filed this year. Mike Beltran filed it. Um, that would be a true constitutional carry bill. It's not going to go anywhere, um, you know, for all of the reasons that we just discussed. Um, but uh, but he did file it. And uh, so hopefully he'll come back and file it again next year. And we're going to keep the pressure on and try to make sure that um, that uh, that they move in the right direction. And, and And we actually get some of these bills passed in the next couple of sessions. Uh, Bob, this is John Salek. Uh, you know, I, I met you uh, back when you were running for governor in, in 2018, and uh, I was a uh, the state committee man from uh, Bay County here on, on okay, our office. Okay, great. And, and we had some extensive talks about about corruption in Tallahassee. And and by the right. way, I, you were running for all the right reasons. Uh, you know, you really were, and I was glad <laughs> well, glad you finished you. as well as you did. But uh, well, you know, you uh, you. you you, you've seen the sausage. You know, that's why I was laughing at some of the stuff Veronica d- discovered. She's she's discovering the sausage making. It's okay? awful. I don't like <laughs> sausage making. <laughs> it's bad. It really but, is. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you, you, one of your issues, you know, when, when we talked previously, was was this corruption, this soft corruption up there. And we, and we kind of ran into some of that last week. We were talking with uh, uh, Gary James, who's running uh, SD7, uh, Senate, di- Senate District Jerry 7. James, Jerry James. Jerry James. Yeah, right. over over in St. John's against Tom Leake. And one of the things he was mentioning was how Tom Leake had, when he started in the Senate, his net worth was like 800000 and now it's over $14 million. And then you look at Amazing, his 
Yeah, and then you look at his contributions, not not his not his official page, uh, you know, on the on the Secretary of State's, you know, website, but his 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 PAC, you know, there's millions of dollars flowing into his PAC, and 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 oh, it's yeah. not it's not just him, it's all of them, okay. Uh, so so this 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 corruption, and and I think Alan Bence, former Speaker House, uh, Alan Bence once described it to me as as a soft corruption, and I'm like, well, that's interesting, you know, how do you how do you differentiate between soft and hard? But it's corruption nonetheless. And, and I've noted this year that uh, the the number of of personal member requests has gone up 30 percent from last year. They're, they're over over seven billion dollars in the House and seven billion dollars in the Senate in personal member requests. I guess you call them earmarks at the federal level. Right. And, and I think our Senator Trumbull, who represents us, is the number two requester <laughs> in, in this stuff. <laughs> well, how 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 do, how do you fix this stuff? How do you is it possible to get rid of these packs? I mean, this this really is corruption at 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 a base level. Yeah, we um we refer to this as the legal laundering of campaign cash uh, because they are laundering the money. Um, and here's here's how they do it. You mentioned political committees. A lot of people are think that there's a limit on on the size of the contribution that you can make to a candidate that's running for the Florida House or the Florida Senate, and uh, and there is a limit. You can only give a thousand dollars if you're giving it to their campaign account. Uh, that's the max you can give. But but the but the problem is is that they can also have a political committee that they establish. Each one of these legislators, even a candidate or other groups. Uh, can have political committees, and and the contribution into a political committee is unlimited. So uh, so Tom Leake, for instance, or any one of these persons, not to single him out necessarily, they have their campaign account, then they have a political committee. So so what difference does it make that there's a that there's a contribution limit when they can get ten thousand, twenty thousand, a hundred thousand dollars contributed into their political committee? Uh, and so what ends up happening is that every Every industry, every association, every union, doesn't matter what it is, every profession that has an association, they all have their own political committees that they've established. And so they raise millions of dollars in their political committees, or if you're a Florida Power and Light, or if you're a, if you're a U.S. Sugar, or um, if you're the, the Florida Teachers Union, um, you know, you just dump a million dollars or $10 million if you're FBL. Uh, or one of the other utilities into your political committee, and then you give that to other political committees, and they then give it to other political committees that ultimately give it to a candidate's political committee. And then at that point, uh, when the candidate files their report, all they have to list is the name of that last political committee that made the contribution. So you'd have to be a forensic accountant, basically, to be able to track all this money back (laughs) to its original source. And the real problem becomes this. Here's the real problem, and this is why we have such a hard time moving really good legislation through the two chambers, and that is that the Senate president and the House speaker, the Speaker of the House, they are so powerful that they have the ability to raise tens of millions of dollars more than anybody else can, and they do it in multiple packs. I mean – I know when I, I, I ran briefly for commissioner of agriculture, I wasn't able to finish the campaign because I had some health issues going on at the time. But Wilson Simpson, who was the Senate president at the time and, and was running for ag commissioner, he had four different political committees that we know of. And each one of those political committees had over $13 million in wow. each one of those four different political committees that he was that he was operating at the time. And so all of these rank and file members of the House and the Senate, they know that the speaker and the Senate president – can either reward or punish them, depending on whether or not they support leadership's slate of legislation and whether or not they go along with the priorities of leadership. And so when a Kathleen Pasadomo says to her chamber indirectly, no gun bills this year, um, they listen because they're, they're scared to death. I mean, we've literally had people tell us, um, not necessarily this session or last session, but in, in past sessions, We've gone to people that we know are friendly to these issues, and they say, you think I'm going to – no, the president's already said or the speaker's already said, I'm not filing that bill. Why would I file that bill? If I file that bill, he'll kill all the rest of my legislation. I won't get anything else done that I need done, or I won't be able to get the money back to my district you know, that, I've, that I've petitioned you know, for, that I've applied, you know, I've applied for. And in some cases, not all, not all the funding requests are, are illegitimate. In some cases, there are legitimate concerns back in districts. Um, that they're trying to bring money home for, and uh, and they're scared to death to buck leadership because they know that they'll get zeroed out. 
Uh, so that's how that's how they maintain control over the chamber. So what's the, so what so the solution then? I think is the campaign finance reform that we need is number one. You have to eliminate, if possible, the ability of these political committees to give money to each other, because that's how the money gets laundered. That's how it gets hidden from view of the public. Um, yeah, so if you could get that that one step, I think would be significant. I don't think you'd ever be able to outlaw them altogether. Um, simply because they've, it's already, you know, money is considered speech, if you will. Um, the Supreme Court's already, already said that in, in some of these cases that have happened at the federal level. So, so trying to zero these political committees out is probably not, not possible. But if you could at least get them, get a, get something passed so that they couldn't contribute to each other, that would go a long way. Um, well, well, the uh, thing I, the thing I, going on. the thing I don't understand, Bob, is, is in, in, from a, a legislature, a, a candidate, and a political committee have to be separate. It is illegal for a candidate to manipulate a political action committee for his own benefit, you know, or her benefit. And, and yet everybody well, winks and nods, you know, because you you actually read these the names of these things, and it's, you know, political committee for the betterment of Florida on behalf of Tom Leake, you know, and it's like, well, what's that all about? You know, it's illegal for, for a candidate or, or representative to have to have a PAC, yet they all have them and they all control them. And and well, nobody not, has not ever been charged, level. right? Not not at the state. Oh, level. not state level. It, it, it is no, it, it is not illegal. See, there's 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 federal statute that you know, governs federal elections and governs you know federal political committees, political action committees, etc. But at the state level, it's all in state statute, and uh, there's nothing that prevents uh, a, a a a a sitting legislator or a candidate from having their own political committee. And some of it is just the name of the political committee might be Friends of Tom Lee, might be the name of the committee. Sometimes they come up with a different name, like, uh, you know, launching, launching Liberty on the Space Coast or something like that might be the name of the committee. Uh, but it's, but it's, there's no question about it. It is, it is, the, uh, it is the committee that is, that is associated with the candidate, and, uh, and everybody knows it. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's a big business uh, when it comes right down to it. And, and these, as I said, these, you know, just a quick story. We have a guy in uh, Brevard County named Thad Altman who's a, if you looked up, if you looked up career politician, uh, the dictionary definition, it would have a picture of Thad next to it. <laughs> um, he was a county commission for eight years, went to Tallahassee and did eight years in the Florida House, went over to the Florida Senate and did 10 years. He got an extra two because of redistricting. And then he went back to the Florida House for another eight years because the term limit has the word continuous in it. So so you can term out in, in one chamber and go to the other chamber for a term and then go back to the other chamber if you wanted to. So that's what he did. So he went back to the House for another eight years. But when he was running for re-election as a senator, as a state senator, he established his own political committee and he raised $320-something thousand dollars in that political committee, 100% of which came from Andy Gardner's political committee. Andy Gardner was the president of the Florida Senate at the time. So the president of the Florida Senate gave one of his senators that was running for re-election $320,000, and, and the senator got re-elected, lo and behold. So who do you think he was loyal to when he went back to Tallahassee? The guy that gave him the $320,000 or his constituents? I would say that I would say that, that it was the guy that gave him the $320,000 and not his constituents that he was that he had the most uh, the most loyalty to. So that's how that's how they manipulate these guys. And, that's um, you know, insane. Got, you've got a guy, you've got a guy out in the Panhandle, good friend of mine, great legislator. His name was Mike. His name is Mike Hill. He was a great legislator. Yeah, he was. Um, but he put he he pushed back against leadership. Um, it was it was a gun bill. He was he was he filed uh, a constitutional carry bill, and the um, and the speaker came in and said don't or he was going to file it, and the speaker said don't file that bill. You know, I see that you've got it in bill drafting, and uh, and we're not having any gun bills this year, so so don't file that bill. And he said, I, "Look, Mr. Speaker, I respect your authority. I understand that that this is your chamber uh, for the next two years, but I promised my constituents that I would file this bill, and I'm going to file the bill." And he did, and lo and behold, the the leadership at the time they found somebody to run against him, and they funded her campaign, you know, to to however much she needed. In order to be able to take him out, and that's and that's the reason that Mike Hill is not a member of the Florida legislature right now because because he had, because he was independent enough and, and and brave enough to 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 live up to a promise he had made to his constituents when he was running, and um, and they took him out, they punished him for it. Yeah, that's, uh, that's just awful. That's the power that they have. 
we saw that here in the panhandle there because the our, our former state, state senator george gainer was handpicked by the, the senate leadership and then they dumped a pile of money in and and it basically scared everybody away because he had so many millions of dollars in, in money right and then what when he turned right. out you know he waited to the last second past literally the last the day right and then and then said i'm not running and all of a sudden jay trumbull our our representative has all his paperwork ready to run for Senate on, on the last Just day like of that. filing. Just like that. Just and like he that. Slides in and no yep. opposition. And it was like, this, this is so freaking crooked. It's not even funny. You know? Well, uh, uh, you no- know, it's they- go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, Bob, because I know we're running out of time, but one of the huge things that the Republican Liberty Caucus does is you you endorse these candidates, and I want people to go to our rlcfl.org, and you can see the candidate questionnaire, and it's very, very extensive. Just like in the, the Second Amendment section, there's like 10 questions, and I know RLC has endorsed Keith Gross, but I wanted you to talk about the power of these endorsements, because you've endorsed, you know, some big names and it's it's a very intense questionnaire if you make it through yeah we've actually it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting process um during the last election cycle um which was the 20 2022 uh election cycle um we had over 120 candidates for the florida house and senate that came to us wanting our endorsement and of course they have to sign our liberty compact and they have to complete the questionnaire we then look at the questionnaire. We review it to determine whether or not they're even worthy of an interview. So of 120-plus that filled out the questionnaire, we ended up interviewing about 83 or 4 of them, I think. So about 40 didn't even make the cut for an actual interview. So we get together. We have a vetting committee uh, you know, that gets together. There's usually five or six of us on the phone call with the legislator, and we review the questionnaire with them. We also grill them, bring up other issues, and and try to get you know more information about their background. So it's very extensive, and we've actually had we've actually had candidates tell us that their questionnaire was education that, that our questionnaire was educational for them, that that we were raising issues that they had not even considered or even had a chance to think through through these issues all the way. Uh, so they actually learned a lot just by completing our questionnaire. And we so we interview them extensively, and then you know they drop off the phone call, and we stay on the call and make a decision whether or not we're going to recommend this person to our full board of directors for an actual endorsement. Um, and so of the of the eighty something that um, that uh, you know that made the cut for um, you know for the interview, some of them were running against each other because we're making endorsements in primary. Now this is very important because that's one of the things that differentiates us from because we're not sanctioned by the party because we're not a club we make endorsements in primaries the party typically doesn't do that although at the state level they'll violate their own rule um you know and and make an make an endorsement (laughs) at the state level even though they're not supposed to but at the local level your local clubs and your local recs typically don't endorse in in primaries we do that's very critical so um you know so we it's it's a it's a winnowing process if you will Uh, 80 some odd that are that are interviewed but many of them are running against each other so we ended up endorsing, I think, forty something in the um, in the actual primary, and then I think it was like uh, I believe it was nineteen of those that we endorsed made it through the primary and the general election, and then nine of our candidates actually uh, won their general election uh, campaigns. But uh, but it builds up over the years. So that was just nine from that one freshman class um, in uh, or or in that one election cycle. But going back through multiple cycles, we end up with a a significant number of people in the House and in the Senate that have gotten endorsements from us in the past. Um, But now we're in the process. We've got something new that we've just launched called Liberty First 2024, Restoring the Republic, which, you know, we were were talking about those those nasty political committees, but, you know, guess what? We've got one. Uh, It's called the Liberty Catalyst Fund. And as hard as we work to try to to try to accomplish campaign finance reform, we're not going to be we're not going to fail to use the tools that are available to us. So so we are raising money uh, for our political committee. And the, the intention is to use that money to try to help our endorsed candidates get elected. Um, so, uh, you know, so we've got a uh, we've got an antidote account set up. You know, you can go to our website, uh, rlcfl.org. And across the top of the menu bar, there's a there's a tab out there that says contribute. 
and that would take you right to the um, you know the contribution page for the Liberty Catalyst Fund. Um, and and again, 100% of that money is going to to the candidates that we have vetted and endorsed. Um, so everybody that everybody knows, a lot of people think that that they're you know they can only afford maybe you know maybe 50 bucks or 100 bucks, and that that's not going to accomplish anything. Or or but you know we have the ability through our Anadot account, you can make a monthly contribution. So we've got people that are making you know they can make a 15 or a 25 dollar a month contribution, and know that because it's being combined with other 15 and 25 dollar a month contributions from all over the state that that's significant and and the power of us all working together regardless of the size of the contribution it's still so important um you know and others will make larger contributions and and that's and that's fine too but every contribution is appreciated regardless of its size and 100 percent of that money is going to go to candidates we we don't pay any expenses out of that money i travel the state pretty extensively and i and the money comes out of my own pocket uh, to do that. Um, so the hundred percent of that money is going to go to elect thoroughly vetted Liberty candidates, constitutional conservatives that are putting themselves out there and running for office. And, and we hope that ultimately, uh, that we're able to help enough of these guys get elected that we can establish an actual freedom caucus right there within the Florida legislature, like the freedom caucus that you see in, uh, in Washington, DC. Love it. Uh, I know you've got to run, but I, the one the one bill I, I was very intrigued about real quick is the term limits for county commissioners. We are desperate for that, <laughs> Bill or Bob. So yes, that, that's a great bill, and it is it is showing some life. It is giving some movement. Um, but there was a, there was one. I think there was one committee that um, uh, that wanted to amend it to uh, to change it from eight to twelve. Uh, uh, but we're trying to amend it back to eight. Uh, it's, so each one of these bills has multiple committee stops that it has to go through in both chambers. Um, it, it may have to go through three different committees before it finally makes its way onto the floor uh, uh, for a vote of the entire chamber. So, uh, so we're trying to make sure that it stays at eight and doesn't go to 12 and try to get that passed. Because right now the only um, – uh, the only counties in Florida that can have term limits for their county commissioners and other offices are what they call charter counties, where the county has its own charter. I, I live in a charter county, Brevard County, Florida, and we have eight-year term limits for our county commissioners. But Love there's it. only 20, either 20 or 21 charter counties in the state. So the other 46, 47 counties don't have term limits. So, I, so this bill would provide that, and it would be, uh, and it would be a mandatory thing. State well, wide, it would definitely would help great. with corruption, but we'll have to have you back. It's Bob White. He's our I'd chairman of the Re- Republican Liberty Caucus and uh, RLCFL.org. And Bob, thanks for joining us. You're, you're doing great work, and it's actually right in front of the face of all these legislators that, you know, we need to be in front of them. Well, I, I listen, I've, I've really enjoyed it very much. I'll come back on uh, as often as you'll have me. And uh, for your <laughs> listeners, just so they know, you are the new regional director for Northwest Florida for the Republican Liberty Caucus out in the Panhandle, and uh, already you and I are working together to establish yeah, new fabulous. local chapters in some of the different counties out there. So, if your listeners are out there in the Panhandle, want to get involved and uh, start a chapter in in their county, they know who to call. That's right. Veronica. That's right. Well, have a okay. have a great day and uh, Liberty. Keep fighting Thank the you. fight, Bob. Thanks. We'll be Will right. Do. Thanks for having me on. We'll be right back. Thanks, I'm Bob. Veronica Live. Okay. Welcome back to Veronica Live, and I'm here with statesman John Salek. And oh my gosh, John, that first interview was lovely already. You know, it, yeah, I've, I've always I've always liked talking to to Bob White. I mean, uh, it, you know, he he he's running for the right. He ran for governor for the right purposes. He wasn't in for the money or fame or anything else. And and, and he understands Tallahassee and how it works, and and all the problems and. And what's interesting, I mean, you know, I've, I've talked to Alan Bentz before years years ago, right after he finished his uh, his stint as Speaker of the, the Florida House, and and you know he he kind of went in there, you know, with his five principles, you know, and he pulled out his little little card with his five principles on it, and and you know he'd read it, and it's like, well, you know, as, as a speaker, sometimes you kind of have to go against those <laughs> to get things done. Well, well I I learned deals, during you know? lobby days, it's whatever the speaker wants. I mean, we met with uh, Speaker Pasadoma, and she was not into election integrity. She was not into anything to do with guns, and and I and I, so I don't know. It was awful to me because as a Republican. 
election integrity, especially after the last election, is very important. <laughs> and then yep. as a gun owner, you know, I'm all about the Second Amendment, and I don't want somebody telling me I can't carry a gun because it's too scary out there, and especially with our border situation. You know, it, it's out of control. It's out of control. Well, yeah. Well, you know, a few years ago when I when I was still state committee man for Bay County, I, I was really pushing, you know, trying to and, and we push we help try to push let legislation through at, at, at Tallahassee. And and I and one of my things has always been this open carry. You right. Know, I was like, right. I, I, I want I want open carry in Florida. You know, if you've got a constitutional right to carry a gun, then open or, or open or hidden or concealed. What What's the difference? You know, you either have the right or you don't. And and I was told, you know, by Senate leadership at the time that, that Kathleen Pasadimo would put a hold on anybody that tried to, to move a bill that had that had open carry on it. And nobody would go against her once she put that hold on it. So I don't know what the deal was, you know, but but there was something going on. The Senate leadership would honor her her position on that on that bill. And. You know, well, and, well, and they're so all the, they're all in bed the with each line. other. They all are right. working on their bank accounts, and then to take out Mike Mike Hill over in the Gates District because he was yep. actually a black Republican. So you know, I, it's shocking. I, it's shocking I, I know. to be taken know, out but... a black Republican on a gun bill. So I, I can't believe it because you know you're trying to be this inclusive tent, and uh, you know it was just shocking. Well, well the, to o- me. the only good thing I'll say about. Kathleen Pasadimo is I think she's term limited out <laughs> after this and and that she's done and maybe once she's gone you know but I don't we'll know get, if it's going to we'll change because you know that was a thing the RLC Republican Liberty Caucus has weight so we got to meet her then we had the one-on-one with the incoming speaker of Britain and I, I felt like you know he's has his agenda too he has his agenda well and, well, you and, know, you, and you it's need, not our agenda Right, but you need to press candidates. You know, Don Gates, you know, is running running for Senate again. Okay, uh, you know, so so you know, press press him. You know, what what's his position on on uh, on open carry? You well, know, it, we've got to have him. Well, on. and, we'll and Trumbull on is you know, Trumbull's not going to do anything. You oh know? gosh, <laughs> he's got the second most. By the way, this was this was a, a astonishing number. It's like. The, the number of member budget requests, this is this is earmarks, personal earmarks for, for a legislator. Trumbull has 174 earmarks in the legislative session right now. He's the number two requester of earmarks okay. in the Senate. And then number when we two, were there, like, you know, I was new as the, the new regional um, director for this this uh, Republican Liberty Caucus, and the uh, Mary Helms is the B- Big Bend director, and she kept trying to get in with Trumbull. And then I tried to, you know, the last few days when I joined the team to see him, and he wasn't even in his office, so we couldn't even see him, you know. And and somebody this Mary had been trying for a long time, and so I don't I don't even know. They go there and they don't care about us anymore, and 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 so I guess I'm just so disillusioned because I didn't realize how bad it was. I'm just naive. So now I'm the the talk show host that's. Uh, you know, been hitting the the gut, and nobody's working for me on my issues. Well, the the thing the thing that the Republicans are forgetting is what got them, what got them there. Okay, the de- my you know, vote. State used to, well, this state used to be run by Democrats. You know, I, and and the Panhandle, by the way, was very influential in, in as far as running Democrat politics in this state, and and we had a, we had a lot of power up here, and that that could stop things. And and uh, and I you know I was always surprised uh, the the Dempsey Barron Building <laughs> over at Florida State is is named for a former senator from this area and Dempsey Barron was the king of Florida Democrats and and running things you know in in the Florida Senate and uh, y- you know the the Democrats got caught up by the corruption and and the people got tired of it and just literally turned them out wholesale and gave control to the Republicans. And, you know, I, I believe in, in cycles of stuff, you know, it's like you, the, you, the Democrats get so bad, get, you get so corrupt and people get tired of it. And then they throw them out and say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to try something different. And it's not it's not the same party. So let's give let's let's give the Republicans a chance. And the Republicans well, get in there and they <laughs> clean everything up and they try to be straight up. And then the corruption starts happening to them. 
and and that's where we're at now you yeah. know with with all these packs i i was i was surprised i i thought i thought florida had the packs in florida were illegal to to coordinate with the candidate but apparently they're not according to bob so no, because that was one of the bills that Bob, the RLC, brought forward is they're trying to handle that. Because well, that ought to be the first thing that happens is, is to eliminate And do you think legislators packs. wanted that, to hear that bill? Oh, no. <laughs> of course. You see, that's, that's a problem. You've got, you got literally, you know, the, the fox guarding the hen house here, you know. It's like <laughs> not going to happen, you know. And back to the corruption thing, you know. It, it's, a, it's just it's soft corruption. And, and they ought to be honest about it. Either raise the contribution limits up. And make them unlimited, but immediately reportable, so you can go to the Secretary of State's webpage on the Division of Elections and see who's given the money to to who. You know, you can, as Bob said, you gotta you gotta try to be a forensic accountant to untangle this stuff <laughs> because you know you go read these packs and it's like you got. You've got like like Tom Leak's pack, you know. Tom Leak's pack gets money from associated. Well, we learned industry. how awful that guy was, so I do right. hope Jerry James right. and, wins. And, and the fact that he's worth fourteen million dollars after oh. just a few years, you know, fourteen million more than he what he started with, okay, or thirteen million more than he started. Well, with. it's disgusting, but but it, but but it happens you in know, DC. It's, it's happening here, you know. Uh, well, one of the things I wanted to talk about, you know, because we're since we've served our country and. And then, you know, we lost three Army uh, Air National Guard to a drone bomb that that hit over in Jordan. And, you know, it took number one, it took President Biden three days to reach out to the families. Um, John, I was really disgusted by that. Three days. OK. And then apparently he where, where, asked where the families if he should like meet the bodies in Dover when they do the, you know, the bodies fly in and they've got the yeah. cough, the American flag over the car. He asked the families if he should do that. What is wrong with this administration? We lost three. And, and you know, t- one, one of the, it was two women at like age 23 and 24. And then uh, a sergeant that was, I don't know, probably like 45 uh, is so sad. And he waits three days to contact the family and then asks if he should meet the bodies. I, I, I'm just like flabbergasted over well, here. Well, did, did you see the video of him standing there with, with Jill and Lloyd Austin and, and uh, the other the other dignitary? Did you I see did. The, the video of that? Uh, did you see his face? I was looking at it and I was like, this guy is gone. I mean, he, <laughs> he had out. his, he had the, he had the 90 year old man, old man face on this blank look like he didn't know where he was. He never and knows it, where it, he is. He had this scowl on his face. He wasn't smiling. He wasn't prayerful. He wasn't, he just had this, this, this blank look on his face that you see on old people that, that have lost, you know, that, that their mental capacity is just zero. And it was it was shocking to see that picture. And he's standing five feet away from everybody else by himself. Yeah, that was weird. You know, Jill's Jill's kind of try, looking at him, trying to decide, should I move over there? <laughs> should I, I move him? over closer to Lloyd Austin? <laughs> you know, I, I mean, it was it was. It was well, at least so he bizarre. didn't look at his watch this time. But yeah, well, you they know. probably took his watch. They probably <laughs> took it off. <laughs> So but, I mean, it. sadly, though, we've lost three Americans. And oh, by the way, we've had over, what, 160 but, but, plus strikes. And then for days, it took him, what, six days for the Biden administration to respond. He's thinking about it. The president's weighing his options. He's thinking about it, John. Yeah, what the yeah. hell? What the and hell? Then they, and then they, they strike empty buildings. They, they give yeah, because they're people, moving all their we're stuff. We're going to the bad guys, you know. It's like, well, wait a minute. You, you're giving the bad guys six days to evacuate whatever empty building that you're going to you, hit. You know, you know, when you were young, you know, we all had like somebody that got in your face. <laughs> and I, I just know growing up, my, my dad said, if somebody ever like punches you, you punch them back. You don't wait six days. Right. right. Uh, you, you know, Veronica, you I, 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 this is a sad statement, but I think, I think our military has become so politicized and, and, and inept that, that it, it's shocking. For, first off, the question I don't, nobody's asking is why were these why were these army troops in Jordan? Well, okay, I was shocked Jordan. that they got str- why, why that this happened there? in Jordan because Jordan has been our ally right. forever. I was right. shocked that this went down in Jordan, and not to mention dot 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 John. There's like forty other 
troops that are wounded, one's critical. We don't even, we don't even know the extent of their injuries. Right. And, and, and this is, and they're saying, Oh, well, we don't want war. We don't want war. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Why do we have all these troops all over the middle East that are being, that are being shot at and, and, and attacked with, with drones and all kinds of stuff. And it's not, and it's also happening at sea there. And, and the part that really offends me, Veronica, is we are shooting down these cheap ass little drones you know, with multi-million dollar missiles. I mean, we're spending hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars shooting down this, this garbage. And, and it's like, wait, wait, let's go back. Let's go to the source of this, Iran, and bomb the hell out of them, you know, and sen- let's send a message, okay? I'm, I'm trying to remember the, uh, <laughs> the, the Patriot movie there with, with um, uh, what was it, uh, where, where the guy says, we're going to send them. A, the president says, "I want to send them a message." You know, to, it was on to Tom, <laughs> not, was it Tom Ryan or whatever. Oh, Jack Ryan. <laughs> yeah, Jack Ryan. You know, like, I want to send a message. You know, <laughs> and he meant, and he meant send a message. Okay, well, you our know, messages like, we're thinking about it. We're thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, and, and it's like, yeah, you know, we'll do. We'll we will strike it at, at a time and and place of our choosing, you know, Lloyd Austin. You know. I'm like you, you jerk, you in, I, impotent jerk. You know? I, I can't even take it. I really, I can't I, I, even. First take off, it. he he should resign. You've heard his excuse, right? Oh yeah, that, we'll, that we'll talk about the statement today judgment. too. <laughs> <laughs> but but they were always in charge. You know, I'm like okay, as they're you yeah, know right. hacking on you. Oh my gosh, I I think for that surgery I, you need to be knocked out. Well, I, I would, ha- yeah, I would think so. But you know, the 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 fact the fact that he was, you know, in in charge while he's getting surgery, and it's like, uh, yeah. So you're sitting there directing strikes while they're on the table, you know, poking at you. <laughs> well, um, I, I've uh, got this Reuters story this morning, and it has like the statements now <laughs> from people. So this is this one. The Iranian Foreign Ministry said um, the airstrikes were violations, John, of the sovereignty and territorial <laughs> integrity of Syria and Iraq, and represent another adventurous and strategic mistake by the United States that will result only in increased tension and instability in the region. Okay. Didn't they shoot like 166 things at us? I mean, <laughs> I think it's 170 something. It, it keeps going up every day. But but you know, it's like we're not increasing the tension. We're, we're, the problem is we're not responding. So to so, it. so the the guy continues though. The spokesman: the U.S. attacks were designed to overshadow the Zionist regime's crimes in Gaza illegal and unilateral U.S. attacks in the region. The root cause of the tensions and crisis in the Middle East is Israelis' occupation and genocide of Palestinians with Americans, America's unlimited support. So dot, 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 all goes back to Israel. <laughs> of course, you know, it's all, it's all, the, you know, it's, it's the Jew state. We need to, we need to eliminate it. What is it, from the river to the sea, you know, is their motto. And, and it's just, and to see, to watch, to watch these fools from the Biden administration go over there and try to tell the Israelis that, you know, what, first off, we're going to tell you how you can fight your war with Hamas, you know, and, and, and we're going to basically put handcuffs on what you can and can't do. And, and then, and we're going to hold, we're going to hold you munitions that we, we sell you as hostage. And, and, you know, a good example of that is, is the stuff with the settlements, you know, they, there was a bunch of guns going over there for the, for the police, that, that the Israelis bought from the U.S. And and the U.S. put a, a hold on exporting those guns because they were going to the police in in the areas where, where the settlements are at. And they were afraid that the this is the U.S. people, right? They're afraid that the guns were going to end up in the hands of the settlers and they would be used to kill the Palestinians. So it's like, you, you people are insane. You've got these <laughs> Palestinians that are going into these into these settlements you know, and there's plenty of video of, of them in there, you know, hell, the, the video comes from the Palestinians who were filming it <laughs> as they were chopping off babies' heads, you know, let's, let's put it, you know, it, it is what it is, you know, I mean. Well, you know, I follow, I follow a lot of Instagrams and this is like the Blue, Bloomberg account. And so people, um, 
you know, were commenting about the donor from Harvard, you know, that's pulled money back and stuff, that he's a problem. And, and then, of course, when you start to read the comments, <laughs> what always happens? It's always Israel. So this guy was great. He goes, no one's buying that BS anymore from a group who has refused offers of statehood five times. Camp David and more. And Hamas, whose agenda is available online, calls for the destruction of Israel. If the Palestinians were able to coexist, then their Arab neighbors wouldn't also fence them in. So it, it just, I mean, we everybody forgets about that. And then, of course, I always tell you every week I follow the White House and Kamala, and it's all about Gaza in between her kill the baby statements, you know, um, which I feel for the, the Gaza people. But, but I mean, what what is this all about? You just, you let Iran send and kill. Now we've killed three troops finally. You know what I'm saying? Well, well, and it took it, six days to respond, John. And it's, it's about it's, Israel once again, right? But it it's, it just shows you the corruption of our of our institutions. You know, the Harvard the, by the, the the guy you think of, his name's Bill Ackerman. He's, he's a billionaire, and and what's what's funny is is not only he the the Palestinian thing got him started, and and then and then what really got him torqued off was was the gay woman and the plagiarism. Doctor Gay, <laughs> and, which there was and, more this week. Didn't you see well, the DEI well, the, woman uh, yes. from Harvard yep. had like Same 40, thing. 40 things that she plagiarized. And one of them was yep. like her husband, I guess, wrote stuff a few years ago and she recycled it, which is there's a yep. name for that recycled plagiarism. <laughs> I'm just calling it recycled plagiarism. <laughs> but uh, I, Harvard is definitely a mess. It is. A well, mess. What, what's what's funny What the one story that's not being reported very much is Ackerman is is committed a, a lot of money. And I don't remember how many millions and, and we're talking like like maybe tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to fund an A.I. program. You know, the chat GPT A.I. Well, well, artificial well, the intelligence. Guy I'm talking about is called Ken, Ken Griffin. Because he okay. said Harvard another, another one. is spawning whiny snowflakes. So that was the Bloomberg yeah. post that okay. <laughs> incited all these people. So but, so that must be another donor you're talking but, about. But, but anyway, but Ackerman, Ackerman's going after the plagiarism stuff. And he's going to – he's funding a, a, a project to use – to start an AI that will start searching all of these academic papers and then, and then looking up all the references to see – how how widespread this plagiarism is in our university systems by by all these leftist professors. I mean, you talk about a dog with a bone now. It's <laughs> well, like, I'm wait, glad. Wait until the chat I'm glad because back and start, uh, there, starts outing all these people that, yeah. that have been lying, cheating, and stealing, you know, to get their their <laughs> DEI promoted position, and and that's the problem, well, and you know? and all along too. White being a white male is a bad thing. You know, George of Washington course. was a white male <laughs> who founded yeah. our helped found our country. White males were involved. It shouldn't. Well, you know, we we have this white privilege thing, Veronica. I don't. I've never. I've never. I, I keep looking for it, but I can't. John, find I'm it, Hispanic. But, <laughs> I, I know, but, but I'm, I'm. I have. I'm not anything. You know, I'm. I'm just. I'm a white white male. You know. And, well, and it's it's so, so funny. I obviously, have white privilege. Just be, yeah. I, I, well, I walk and, around and people just fall down and worship me. I mean, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Which, well, that when I, you know, I always reflect back to when I was on the that New York Times two hour thing. Um, it was what was it a, a chat with fifteen people across? Oh Florida, yeah, yeah. I and these that black one. <laughs> women, one of them engaged me that I was too white of a Hispanic. And yep. the funny thing is, I don't ever, and I've said it a zillion times. It's it's our work ethic, what I look at. Like, you work really hard. I work really yep. – like, every single day. We don't walk around saying, you know, white privilege, yeah, give me that on a platter. We actually have to work for what we do. I, and, I know. It, you know. It's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, hey, I've been here for 12 hours already, and I'm still not done, and i got to have this done by the morning, so I'm going to be here another six hours working on this because this has to be done tomorrow morning. It's not like you get to go home, you know, because it's like tomorrow morning is tomorrow morning, and that's that's – you you will have it done. So you make those decisions. It's a personal decision you make. Either you're willing to put in the work or you're not. And the problem is we've got too many people nowadays that are not willing to put in the work, but they want all the reward. Well, that, that was a funny thing because one of our guests canceled and I was offered another 
you know, author with a 500 page book yesterday afternoon. <laughs> and, and I don't let anybody come on here that I haven't like been digging in their book, you know, like we read the books and I, right. and I'm right. still sick. So I was like, I, uh, no, <laughs> no, because if you're going to come on Veronica live, we're going to do the work. And, uh, you know, I, I was still too sick to, to dig through a 500 page book and I wouldn't host you, you know, right. but it's all right. about you know, that work have- ethic. Right. We want to have an intelligent conversation with, with these people and, 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 and not just, not just wing it, you know, it's saying the show notes, you know, we, we do show prep every week with, with oh lots my gosh. of stories. We haven't from. even, we haven't even got into the stories yet, which right. we will this morning. Got Afterburner yet, you know, but, <laughs> but, you know, so there, there's a lot of work that goes into, you know, being on the air for 30 minutes or an hour or two well, hours, or three, three hours, hours is a lot, a lot of, of work, hours. you know, right. it, it definitely is. No, and, I, and you, and you talk to any any successful radio show host, and they'll tell you the same thing. You know, it's like if you're not willing to do the, you don't walk in the studio, you know, sit down at the mic and 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 go blather for three hours. It's like you well, do well that, maybe you if we had stuff. staffers, John, someday. <laughs> but I did hear Dan Bongino this week talking about that. That yeah. you know, it's hours of prep. Um, and and I did send you because I heard the statement from. Lloyd Austin talking about, you know, what he went through. Um, and, and so I wanted to read a little bit about what he said. He, he said, I want to be crystal clear. We did not handle this right. So this is when he didn't tell the president that he was having <laughs> prostate surgery, had to take an ambulance, was in the hospital. And I did not handle this right. I should have told the president about my cancer diagnosis. I should have told my team and the American public to include Veronica and John. And I take <laughs> full responsibility. I apologize to my teammates and the American public or people. And then he says, I want to make clear that there were no gaps, John, in authorities and no risks to the department's command and control. And at every moment, either I or the deputy secretary was, was, we were full in charge and we are, we've already put in place some new procedures to make sure that this, <laughs> these lapses in notification don't happen. Okay, the woman was on vacay in Puerto Rico, his deputy, and didn't even fly home. Right. So I, I, these but, people so are it, embarrassing. Uh, it is. And, and, the, and the president of the United States, the commander-in-chief of the military, was not informed he didn't have a clue what was going <laughs> well, on. Well, he's checked out anyway. Well, yeah, Obama yeah, well, didn't well, know he was. The president <laughs> is, didn't know, apparently. Or maybe uh, the real president did know, and Joe didn't. <laughs> uh, well, you know, and, 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 I, and I talked about this uh, with a couple of people because I was like, well, maybe, you know, why didn't he tell Biden is Austin living his own life his in his own lane and the Department of Defense is doing their own thing and not even talking to the Biden administration that's oh, why that's, exactly what, that's, that's exactly why we have on. 6 days to until that's we launch exactly what's going on. you know anything you, until we call parents of fallen soldiers yeah that's exactly what's going on it, the DOD is running you, you know this and this kind of goes it goes to the conversation we're about to have, you know, on the CIA and the yeah. FBI. I, I think you can throw the FBI, the, the Department of Defense into that 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 group. OK, it's well, broken. well it's seriously broken. I'm here with Statesman John. And when we come back, we're going to talk with uh, J. Michael Waller on his new book called Big Intel. And we'll be right back. Welcome back to Veronica Live, and we are here with our next guest this morning, and his name is uh, Michael J. Michael Waller, and his book is called Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains, and he's a former operative for the CIA and a counterintelligence expert, and uh, what a book. Welcome, Mike. Welcome to Veronica Live. Hi, Veronica. Well, uh, l- to kick it off, you are so interesting, and you you open the book. You're you're just a, a college student that's a Republican that gets to meet cool people, and so I wanted to start there. And I have a question too: Is how are you fluent in Spanish uh, that you end up in Central America? <laughs> so we'll just kick it off there. Oh. <laughs> I wasn't even fluent fluent at the time. I just happened to speak, you know. 
high school Spanish. So okay. He was an exchange student in South America, and they said, "Don't go to Afghanistan. Go to Central America." So I did. Wow, and um, and you know, you were in college, and all of a sudden, you do end up in Central America. So talk about that. I mean, obviously, to me, you you were leading the charge in a in a crazy region at the time, fighting communism. It was a crazy region then as now, and and certainly a crazy time. It was uh, then. It was uh, so I was a freshman in 1980 at George Washington University, where Jimmy Carter is in his last months as president and Ronald Reagan's coming in. I was able to vote for Reagan absentee, but I had to show my ID at the town hall before registering for an absentee ballot. And so I voted for Reagan, and as a Senate intern, you get to meet everybody if you want to. A lot of, a lot of young kids are too shy to go around and take these opportunities, but if you go out and you start networking with people, there's, there's no one that you can't meet. So I went ahead and I did that, and after a while, at becoming a student journalist and getting involved with college Republicans and Young Americans for Freedom, I became a youth coordinator for, um, unofficially, for the Reagan White House for his strategy to push back and dismantle the Soviet Union. And growing up, how did you realize that communism was bad? Did that come from your family, or you learned that in college in all of these things that you were doing? I learned it by being a communist dupe. <laughs> that was, that's the best way. You just get burned. Uh, it was, I was a 15-year-old kid. No, my family had no politics at all. Okay. Um, my, my grandfather and grandmother, one was a Democrat and one was a Republican, and we never knew which was which until after they passed away. So, so, uh, so no, we had no political leanings at all in our family, but I got involved at age 15 in the environmentalist movement. This is in the late 70s, and uh, I was worried about a nuclear power plant that was being built in our state because it was going to send boiling water from the cooling system of the reactor out to sea. And I was concerned it would destroy the fishing areas where my grandfather and my dad and I would and my brother would fish. And uh, so that's what got me involved. And then I, they did gradually take us. This is in New Hampshire. So this is there were uh, radical professional radicals who came in from California to train these new members of this anti-nuclear group. And they took us aside for what I later learned were, were called struggle sessions. And they'd isolate each of us and they'd grill us and they'd try to tear us down inside. And then they said to me, so why do you want to join this movement? I said, um, because I'm concerned about the environment. And isn't that the right answer? And they said, no, stupid kid. This is all about overthrowing American capitalism. Oh, oh wow. And, and, and that's how you began. Uh, well, and then I wanted to ask you, tell us some, some more. You tell us about your background, how you see yourself, because you are so intriguing and have done so many things. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it's it, it's kind of normal, actually, if you come up through this, you don't see why other people would think it's interesting because it's just kind of what you do. Uh, but it's so my own background was uh, I wanted to go into the CIA as a college student. I was, was studying Latin American affairs, but then realized all the professors were Marxist. So I switched to Soviet affairs and studying the USSR. And it was great because you had a former KGB agent as a professor. You had uh, exile from Hungary who knew some of these old uh, pioneers of critical theory, great anti-communist, all these other people. And you're there now at a time when Reagan is doing, implementing his strategy and meeting the other people who are doing that because you happen to be in the right place at the right time networking. So I wanted to join the CIA and serve my country that way. Well, actually, first I, I, I was in Army ROTC, but this was when the Army was run by depressed Vietnam vets and colonels <laughs> who had nowhere else to go. And the Army wasn't doing anything. And so I went I didn't even make it to basic training. I just bailed out, and I went and I joined the Contras in Nicaragua, which was the insurgency that President Reagan was backing to overthrow the newly installed Marxist-Leninist regime in Nicaragua. And and I did that through the, my different connections made through Young Americans for Freedom and the people at the White House who set me up to say, go down there as a student journalist, which I was. I'd started a, a conservative student paper at my college. 
And that's how it began. But then uh, one of my professors, who I was very close to, and 40 years later, we're still close friends, Professor Jack Ziak, he was an intelligence officer at the, based out of the Pentagon. And he said, with, with your temperament and, and the fact that you're mission-oriented, uh, the CIA will either grind you down or spit you out, or you'll, you'll quit in demoralization. Well, meanwhile, working in the Senate, I had met another Senate staffer, a senior one, uh, on the Senate Intelligence Committee named Angelo Cotavila. And he, he's a brilliant, he was a brilliant man. And he said to me, you will hate the CIA and it will hate you. And I really took that to heart, but I still wanted to serve. And then one, one thing led to another. And I through a, through a national intelligence officer at the White House, I, I, uh, there was a, he connected me up with an old uh, veteran of the Office of Strategic Services. That was our World War II intelligence agency against the Nazis. And he wanted to hear my story and hear my what I wanted to do. And then he gave me some walking around money. And then he told me to go to St. Matthew's Cathedral, Vigil Mass. You know, I was a Catholic, but I wasn't a good one. I mean, he knew in advance. Yes, I, I love that knew, right? in the book. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so, yeah, do I tell. Thought, well, this is a week before going out with the conference. And he, and he gave me... He gave me a thousand bucks in two envelopes for walking around money, and I thought this is pretty nice of him. Why is he doing this? And then he said, "Now go to go to church, sit in the back of the pew at the cathedral, and don't leave until somebody talks to you." Well, who shuffles up at the end of mass? But this, it, well, it's personal security detail around CIA Director William Casey, who was an unmistakable figure. He had been in the OSS in World War II also, and he uh, he had this audacious idea to parachute allied troops and German exiles, anti-Nazi German exiles, behind Nazi lines after the after Operation D-Day so that the troops could march up from Normandy all the way through France to Berlin. And these guys would organize sabotage raids and other, other efforts to support the invaders as they're coming in from the D-Day invasion to take Berlin. It was a brilliant thing. Everybody so so you knew who he was, could. right? Mike, well, I you... didn't know that part of him. Yeah, I knew he was Reagan's CIA director. I met but, him. But once were you back. not floored? I mean, you're, you're this young guy that you know is in a Catholic church yeah. and in and... the cathedral. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, what were you thinking? Well, I felt I, I was like, oh, cool. There's the CIA director. I'm going to say hello. <laughs> so, so it's, it's Washington, right? And you meet, and, it's, yeah. and he shuffles right up next to my, where I was standing, and and I just shot out my hand, and I said in this sort of dumb way, "Oh, nice to meet you, Mr. Director." And he just looked at me, and he mumbled something at me, and I didn't right. understand it. He said right. it again, and I didn't understand it. And then he shuffled away, and then a guy behind me, behind him, who had a military bearing you know, like a sergeant kind of bearing. And she said, Capitan Luque, remember that name. And it, it was the Spanish name of Captain Luque or Captain Luke. And I said, okay, fine. And that was that. And I just didn't know what to think. And the organ is playing as the recessional hymn is going. Casey's <laughs> gone out the doors. Uh, well, and, and fast forward, you end up in Central America. And, and so how old are you when all of this? Like, I'm reading this in the book, and I'm going, where's your mother? Does she know you're flying off to Central America to save the world? <laughs> She's terrified. <laughs> did she know? I mean, what did you tell your mother? Well, yeah, it wasn't a secret mission. I was going down as a student journalist, and we were going okay. to tell, we were going to write about the Contras, and uh, and I had invited actually uh, journalists from other student newspapers like the Dartmouth Review and Okay, and, so you were traveling in a pack. California Review. <laughs> no, it was just two of us. It was nobody else dared <laughs> to go except one guy, Mike Johns from the University of Miami, and uh, so we went down. And at customs, they said, you know, what's your business here? Because Honduras actually had a good border guard, a good immigration control system. <laughs> um, they And they said, and I didn't have an excuse. I didn't have a point of contact down there. I didn't know where I was going to stay. I'm this kid with sort of longish hair. And I, I looked, I could have been a communist, you know, because he had, or, had all these, <laughs> or a dupe. Because you had all these Marxist dupes going down with solidarity visits for okay. the Sandinistas and the communist girls in El Salvador. And they're using Honduras. So they were giving me the runaround. And finally, I said, I demand to speak to Capitan Luque. 
I thought that was my point of contact. <laughs> and they didn't know what to do, and they finally found their supervisor, and some time went by, and then somebody came out and said, okay, go through it. They let us through. And there was a pickup truck full of Contras outside, and they took us away. I mean, what were you thinking? I mean, I, I, I read this in the book, and I mean, to me, you're this young spy that doesn't know he's a spy, but thinking he's a journalist, Mike. Right. I didn't have a clue. I, I, and I was a journalist. <laughs> I, nobody was telling me what to write. Uh, nobody was saying what I could or couldn't say or censoring me. I just went down. Well, that was just an episode to get my feet wet. Were you, were you ever scared? The task. Uh, afterward. Okay. Okay. Or, you know, you're, you're on some, you're doing something crazy or stupid or even just a, a cool amusement park ride. And like, I am scared. Let's do it again. Okay, but when you're jumping out of uh, an airplane with a, a parachute, you normally have a parachute. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, and I, I haven't done that. No, we had no parachute. We didn't jump out of planes, but we ran into situations where communists are shooting at you and stuff. So that's pretty, pretty, you know, tough, especially when you had never gone through basic training. Right. Yeah, I was going to say, did that, did that change your perspective when the bullets started flying? <laughs> <laughs> Well, when you can see tree branches coming down around you and you think, well, this is real. Um, but you're, you're either some people just, I guess, freak out and panic and other people just go ahead. Or in my case, I was just, the contractors just said, hey, come on, get down. And, and, and then they, you know, there was some firing back. And then I said, hey, can I go through your training to, you know, see what this is like? And he said, yeah, sure. So we, I did my basic training um, as an insurgent. <laughs> oh my goodness! And and how long were you doing this, Mike? It was about two weeks at a time. Ended up being for seven years. I was with them until the end of the war. Off and wow, on. wow! And yeah. and you mentioned in the book meeting President Reagan. So talk about that. I mean, you've met all these incredible people. Yeah, and it wasn't like I set out and tried to do it. I was just doing my thing, and then so. So running the, the uh, working with the other guys at College Republican National Committee and Young Americans for Freedom to work on on pushing the Reagan doctrine, it was sort of it was a team effort. And then one day it was I was a Spanish speaking guy who the White House staff knew. So they said, please come to the White House. Uh, we're going to meet at the Roosevelt Room at this day at this time. And President Reagan is going to come out. So make sure you're dressed well. And sure enough. So I went representing the different youth organizations, and there were, I don't know, a dozen of us, 15 of us from different groups who were supporting Reagan's Central America policy. And we all had name tags on. So it's said, hi, my name is Mike. And so Reagan didn't know who I was, but then he went around the table. We all stood up, and he shook us each by hand, called us each by name because we had our name tag, and I'd forgotten I had my name tag. And President Reagan came up, shook my hand, put his other hand on my shoulder and just looked me in the eye. And he had that, you know, that Reagan smile. And he just said, Mike, I'm so happy that you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> Don't give up. Or that effect. I would have <laughs> oh, fainted. Like, oh. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, mean, I am just hooked now. You know, I'm, I'm not quitting this guy. So, so at, at this, how old were you at this point, Mike? I was 22. 22 then and was was ronald reagan a rock star to you at, at this point like to most of us oh absolutely he was he was the living you know the greatest man alive and and, and you knew that you do anything for the man <clears throat> yeah yeah you know mike one of the things in, in your book that i was really intrigued by was was all all the people that that you that you were able to talk to through your networking that were able to give you what I'll call sage advice mm-hmm. and, and their awareness of what was going on, you know, with the CIA, with, with, uh, you know, like telling you like, you know, you wouldn't like it if you joined it and, and you know, like, Oh, by the way, watch out for this Colonel. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that was <laughs> funny. <Yeah>. Colonel North. <laughs> yeah. Referring to Colonel North. So, so there, there obviously were a lot of people in Washington that were aware of what was going on and, and were able to, you know, kind of help, guide you or counter you know counter some of your natural instincts where you wanted to go is 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 that awareness gone now and and i gather some of that was 
like you mentioned, because these guys were from the OSS, you know, they were from a different generation and, and, and had a much different perspective and awareness of the world is, is that gone or is that still there today? I think it's been beat out of us. What made the OSS successful in world war II was it was hiring amateurs who didn't know what they were doing and they had not been in a bureaucracy where they were told what they could not do or never really told what they could do except put on your blinders on either side and just look straight ahead and do what you're supposed to do in your cubicle. Hmm. And the OSS was full of these idealists and brash people who thought very differently and, um, and who had all kinds of different skills. And so like when Bill Casey was advising the British and American generals about his plan to parachute people in inside Nazi lines to pave the way for the D-Day invasion all the way to Berlin, he was wearing civilian clothes. He was only a lieutenant. But he was talking to generals, and they dressed him in civilian clothes so he could speak to the generals as if he was in a peer group, even though he was much younger. So that was a military discipline that was broken on purpose because they wanted the best ideas to go to the top. So um, one of the questions I had, it's, it, there's a statement somewhere in the book saying, you know, the infection of the CIA and the FBI. I, I just, and, and, you know, your book talks about their deep state villains. I, I so feel that way now. You know, I, I want them gone. I want them reorged, you know, and you talk about in the book how to, how to redo that. Uh, why, why, why have they become the deep state villains you know when, when you're an american fighting for america and doing the right thing why has it gone to hell in a handbasket mike well it's a lot more complicated than it might seem first if you think of the cia and the fbi they're, they're just bureaucracies like any government entity is just a bureaucracy so it's not something we need to revere it's not something that we that, that has to stay in its place and so it's simply a structure and a, and a set of procedures with certain authorities run by people who have you know, careers in mind, whether for, for altruistic reasons or not. That's all it is. So it can be, you think of any government agency, but each one does its own thing, and it's just a bureaucracy. So if you're in this bureaucracy, and bureaucracies tend to be cautious because you want to get promoted in that bureaucracy, you want to spend all your money that year because if you don't spend all your appropriated money, then Congress will cut it the following year. So even when you accomplish your mission, you search for other missions in order to justify your budget and hopefully expand your budget. And then comes the personal side of it where you want to get ahead because you, you, you want to do your job, but you always want to advance. So you're seeking to get promoted. So you will do what needs to be done in the bureaucracy to get promoted. And then you have the careerism of the more, the more active ones. So you have the passive promotion people, and then you have the active promotion people that really, really want to get ahead. So they'll brown nose their way and do anything to get to the top because they want to either get in those top senior executive service positions or they want to be able to retire with full benefits, keep their security clearances, and then become government contractors or work for some big company with a sterling record. And, of course, you get your participation trophy equivalents in the bureaucracy. <laughs> no, they have those, too. Yeah. Yeah. They do. I mean, you know, they have them in the military. Also. Oh, my God. Well, that, them, but... well, we talk about it. Now they're all generals, apparently, because yeah, yeah, they've gone yeah, political but... and woke. Yeah, Veronica was saying yeah. we, we can now include the military in the same – batch with the CIA and the FBI as far as the bureaucrat monstrosity and, and out of control. So, goes, but, so Mike, do yeah. you think, I think cause Obama was in eight years, he kind of got all of his people into these places and, and fast forward, you know, you talk about the, that FBI agent, Peter Strzok, the one that was leading stroke. the, the <laughs> investigation of the Russian interference and having an affair. And, uh, you know, th so it was so political, so am I wrong that it's so political? I mean, because you now you're an expert on all of this. Well, most bureaucracies are liberal. If you just look at the Federal Election Commission 
donation findings. They don't give you the individual's names, but you can say X percent of Justice Department employees gave to Democrats versus Republicans. So the Justice Department is like 96 percent Democrats, according to just the voting records. So no bureaucracy is 50-50 the way the country is. So all the federal bureaucracies are overwhelmingly politically liberal. So they want presidents who are going to pump more money into their bureaucracy and give them more and more power, which means the central government then becomes more and more and more powerful. Well, So you already had the Obama people there before right. Obama even ran for office. Mm, okay. Yeah, and and it's not as you know, people say, Well, where's the smoking gun? you know, and it's not it's not they don't send memos to each other on this stuff. <laughs> it, it it's a culture, it's it's a mindset, you know, and, and that's that's the part that, that shocks me. I I'm I'm just curious, Michael, if you've been following any of this this uh, story that's kinda kinda starting to break about about the bombings, the, the January sixth bombings, you know, where there were bombs found outside the DNC and where, where Kamala Harris happened to be, and and it now it turns out one of the one of the Democrat House leaders was also there, and they're talking about all these these Secret Service details and the Capitol Hill police security details that apparently did not see this bomb, or if they saw it, they knew it wasn't a a real bomb, and and that there is some kind of narrative being developed as a plan to to you know blame blame MAGA Republicans you know for trying to to bomb, bomb, uh, you know, Kamala Harris and, and the House leadership. I, I'm just curious if you've, if you've been following any of that. And, and do you think that 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 the, these agencies are so bad that they would actually participate in this stuff? Well, John, I live on Capitol Hill. And so those supposed bombs were planted just a few blocks from where I live. So, yes, I've been following it very closely. Uh, you, you have... You have carjackings. You have congressmen getting carjacked just a few blocks away from Capitol Hill. Uh, real serious stuff going on. But a bombing is different because if you look at the way the bombs were, they were improvised munitions. They'd been there 17 hours, but they had a one-hour old-fashioned manual kitchen timer attached to it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I haven't made like, any bombs lately, Mike, so... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but think of that. If you're going to plant a bomb that's supposed <laughs> right. to go, go off much later, why do you put a one-hour kitchen timer that goes tick, 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 you can hear the bomb. So that in itself shows that there's something phony there. And then, mm-hmm. then the videos that came out from security cameras, of none of the real bomb protocols were followed. You had, you had uniform personnel standing around the bomb you had them allowing children walk past the bomb after the bomb was right I, I did see that you, 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 you let the vice president elect of the united states go into the building even though the bomb was there <laughs> this is just not you know so th- this is a this was extremely suspicious to put it most mildly as were so many other things like when 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 senator ted cruz asked the uh, the head of the national security branch of the fbi who knew that, that the questions would come in advance, he said, was the FBI involved or any of its agents or personnel or or assets, were any FBI assets involved in the planning or execution of criminal acts of violence at the U.S. Capitol on January 6th? And she couldn't say no. She wouldn't say no. That, that was shocking. It really was. <laughs> Disgusting. I mean, you, you could say... Senator, that's a preposterous question. Of course, the FBI would never do such a thing. It didn't. It's, it's different to say, well, we had assets in there to to keep track of the situation, right? To make sure that nothing would. No, it's a. He, he his crew specifically were were they involved in the planning and execution of criminal acts of violence? Boom. That to me is a yes. Well, one of the questions that kind of ties in with this, Mike, is the the Russian interference and and the fifty plus um, big names that signed that letter saying that the Hunter Biden um, laptop was a fake story. You know, Jim Clapper, Leon Panetta, John Brennan. I, I mean, it just hurts my heart that I want these agencies disbanded because everybody's so dirty. So did you know when all of this was happening, did, did your bells go off that this was fake? 
Oh yeah, absolutely. As soon as it first came out, because it, back when I would, when I was um, in in graduate school, I studied under a former Soviet bloc intelligence officer who specialized in planting and spreading disinformation. And he had a whole disinformation documentation center at Boston University, which was not to teach us how to do disinformation, but how to detect it. So I knew right away that it was it was fake for two reasons. Uh, the first one was the Russians and the Chinese both prefer to have American leaders who are predictable in their attitudes and behavior and who are known quantity so that they know how, so that the perpetrators know how to manipulate them. Well, Donald Trump is anything but a predictable person. <laughs> so true. <laughs> And he has a whole new thing in terms of dealing with American leaders. And the Russians didn't want that, neither did the Chinese or, or any other adversary. And that was the first. One. The second one was the people making the accusations themselves had had no problem with Vladimir Putin. They were fine to do business with him. When the Soviet system collapsed, they were trying to save the Soviet system. When the new Russian Federation was coming into, into being, they helped build the Soviet gangster state. That was the Clinton administration. They built it. They were fine with it. It wasn't until Putin started started taking act against the Soros people around who were doing their civil society programs around Russia. That's when Hillary Clinton and the others turned against Putin. But she was still doing the Uranium One deal. So you had all these other types were fine with the Russian government until that point. So for them to suddenly be outraged about how the Russian government is trying to manipulate American elections, they've been trying to manipulate our elections since the 1920s, and you never heard of people. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, you know, you're going to go up and you say, okay, this is, there's some disinformation about this disinformation. That was the first thing. <laughs> the problem was Trump was so, he was acting so defensive about it that I thought, oh, maybe there's something there. So I didn't quite know, but it was it was my friend David Satter, who was a veteran journalist, Moscow correspondent, who was the first one to come out and say, this whole thing is a setup. And, and he wrote it in late 2016, early 2017. And the whole thing is a setup, and here's why. And he explained it all. And sure enough, he was proven right. But, but I'm, like, physically ill that these, these big names – of stature would, would even sign this letter. I would never sign a letter like that ever. Why did they do right. that? This gets, back to, this gets back to your earlier the politics. About the, <laughs> yeah. About the politics of the bureaucracies though. And about Obama coming in and then they were already there before Obama was there. So they, this is your intelligence establishment. If you look at them and it's bipartisan, there were some, some Republicans on that list too, but they were, you know, very moderate Republicans. They weren't political Republicans. They just happened to be Republican oriented, but they were still intelligence establishment. So this is where the fraternity part comes in, where you never mm. break out of your fraternity. You never criticize a fraternity brother. Well, you can't say <laughs> brother anymore because that's genderist. You can't say fraternity yeah, because yeah. that means fraternal. But you get so 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 you get all these guys who 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 have they sign a letter based on facts they haven't seen firsthand. That's, that's, that's one first breach with any basic intelligence protocol. And then you, you write it in a wishy-washy way that says it has all the hallmarks of Russian disinformation, but further down they say we really don't know because we haven't seen it. That part, you know, they carry that <laughs> way down the letter so nobody will read it. And, and then they all sign it, and, and they, it's leaked to Politico, which is a liberal political mm -hmm. uh, website and, and newspaper and then it gets the desired headline and of course it's all timed three days before biden's debate with trump so biden can then use that as a prop in the debate saying well just the other day 51 intelligence officers signed this saying that the hunter Biden, the hunter laptop story is russian disinformation that's that was the sole purpose of that whole exercise was to help biden during that debate and when you're an intelligence officer it's like when you're when you're a retired general officer you know, when you're a retired general, you're still under a uniform code of military justice discipline. Right. And you still speak for your former service, even though you're no longer serving. And that's that way for the rest of your life. That's why retired generals, until this point, were always, for the most part, pretty cautious 
in what they said because it was the prestige of the stars on their shoulders in their rank, you know, which has now devolved to a pay grade. It shows what a bureaucracy the military is where you're not so much a rank as you are a pay grade. Really? Okay. So yeah, let's call yeah. it pay, pay grade, a four star pay grade, you know, instead of a four star general. But that's how bureaucratic they are. But so you have these intelligence chiefs, including some who were former generals, like General Mike Hayden. So he's double hatted coming out now being political. So they're giving political cover to the rest of the bureaucracy saying it's okay to be politicized as long as you politicize the right way. <laughs> what, which... so, so, so how do we, how do you, how do you fix that? I mean, can you, can you fire your way out of this? I mean, is it a matter of, of, of uh, you know, firing like the top three layers of the FBI or four or five layers of the FBI and, and hopefully finding you know, people that, that are not. I mean, and you talk about it in the book, dismantling and moving, you know, different sections in different areas. The best I've heard is move them out of Washington, you know. That's right. Number one. <laughs> <To Huntsville. laughs> well, yeah, and, and, then, so, and that, this is just to set up a, a sort of a basis for a discussion because there's a lot more to it than that. And, and it's, it's, it gets pretty complicated because imagine if you, if you break the quarantine of bureaucratic Washington and you spread it around the country, you're putting now central government agencies all around the country in their well-paid communities to jack up housing prices and everything else in these local cities and towns. And then, and then creating now these new pockets of politicized permanent federal employees all around the country. No, on the one hand, let's get them out of Washington. On the other hand, do we want to infect the country with this? <laughs> uh, no. It hunts Alabama's exactly. Bama. <laughs> I'd send them back. Oh, I got some, some howls from people from Huntsville saying, oh, don't send them down here. We don't want them. <laughs> uh, but you but can't you... fire career employees mm. because of the civil service and, and related laws. They simply can't be fired. But you can abolish their positions. And then give them nowhere to transfer to. So they'll have to leave government service. And if they're no longer in government service, they don't need their clearances. So strip them of their clearances. So this, this is one way to do it. But we need the functions that well, we need. We need many of the functions that the FBI performs and that the CIA performs. It's like saying we don't want any more wars, so let's abolish the military. I mean, it's just a dumb You can't do it. You can understand. Yeah. No, but you can understand how people get frustrated. Right. Things things like that but no you can't so so what do we do so so you take the fbi which has had this terrible mission creep that's gone way before way beyond its original purpose always finding new enemies to fight and you say well you've got the criminal side of the criminal investigation side of the fbi let's move that to the u.s marshals our nation's oldest law enforcement service. It's had very few scandals throughout its history. It hasn't become as woke yet as the FBI. Move the criminal uh, branch and the um, and the FBI Academy over to the Marshals Service and then change the whole ethos of it. But in so doing, abolish a number of positions so that certain people are going to not make the transfer. Take the uh, counterterrorism functions and move those pers- certain of those personnel into other agencies that already do counterterrorism and so on down the line I mean, if you have a ATF which is a problem in itself and you have the FBI that also performs ATF functions except it doesn't collect the taxes well you don't need two agencies doing the same function so let's move FBI's you know, firearms violations unit to ATF and then we can we can turn ATF to sausage later on. Well, well, I did love how your book breaks it all down. Mike, you have solutions. So I don't know if the FBI and CIA are calling you. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 no. They don't. They, I, you know, well, some insiders say, you know, you have a point, uh, but it, it, your ideas are too simple. Here's the way it should be. It's like, well, this is great. This is the kind of discussion you want because you want insiders informing you know, how, how it might work. And I did have a lot of help from people on the inside in, in formulating these ideas. But then there's a neat thing that every people down in, in Florida can, can do on their own. And that is to make sure to pay close attention to the sheriff's elections every election year. So the sheriff yeah. is the top law enforcement officer in every county, and they're elected by the people. 
we just had him on. To the public. Yeah, yep. we just had him on. Constitutional officers here. And and they believe it. They believe they're constitutional officers. They believe it. Yeah, you need our sheriff yeah. up in D.C., Mike, because all those carjackings and you know shoplifting, it wouldn't it wouldn't go over. It wouldn't be having it, uh, Mike. Uh, just, just real quick, uh, do, do you think we will ever have anything on on the scale of of a, a church hearing again? I don't know if you remember those from way back when. The last time the CIA was really overhauled. Uh, do, do you think we'll ever see anything like that again, or is it just too far well, gone? Well, that was in the mid-60s. We need something like that again. And Congressman Jim Jordan, who's the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee and a great American, he called for this a year ago, saying we need to have a church committee to look at the weaponization of government. So that got people's ex- expectations up high, because the church committee was Senator Frank Church in the Senate, had a bipartisan committee, but it was a very, very liberal committee um, with 130 or so different top flight staffers and investigators and litigators and and so forth. Really first rate, but it was a giant, giant staff. They had to do their job. Well, Jordan had heard of the church committee, but he didn't know any of the details. He only hired five staffers. <laughs> So the House leadership didn't understand the magnitude of what they were up against. I think they do now, but they haven't appropriated money for their own, you know, their own chamber to be able to do these things. So that has yet to come. But you really need it when you have both houses in in the right hands where they agree with one another on what needs to be done. Where you have Jim Jordan and Congressman Loudermilk and so many others. Matt, uh, Matt Gates and others, they just really know what they're doing or they have the right instincts and they're effective communicators. Uh, you need that on the Senate side. And you certainly have senators who are up to the task. The Senator Ron Johnson, yeah. if the Senate goes Republican this year, he'll be chairman of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, and he can investigate whatever he wants. Mm, that'd be great. So, yes, there is, uh, yeah, there is yeah. hope for that. Yeah, Tom Lee and 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 Rand Paul and and uh, uh, you know Ted Cruz. I mean, we've got a we've got a really good lineup on the Senate side that could that could carry the that could carry the load if we would let them. Yes. So one of the questions well, I had. A few senators to do that. Yeah. Well, um, one of the questions uh, I had for you too, Mike, was you talk about uh, the most famous spy ever, Robert Robert Hansen. And, and your encounter. And um, so I wanted you to just tell me about him because, I, I, you know, I remember when that whole thing broke because he looks like such a normal guy and, you know, and then he ends up being this awful, awful spy. Well, of all the, of all the FBI agents who was interested in my academic work and i'm going to say wow listen to me i should have all the fbi people in what I do. <laughs> it was a, it was unique work at a unique time so what it was was this was in the early 1990s with the collapse of the soviet union i was in moscow in the kremlin the day uh, russia and ukraine and belarus seceded from the ussr and declared that it was abolished so it was a pretty wild place to be at the time but i was doing my dissertation work on what was happening to the soviet kgb during the soviet collapse and then after the Soviet collapse. So I've made contacts with a lot of Russian journalists and officials and human rights figures and so forth to to be in the middle of all of this and to pull out documents and to talk to a lot of senior KGB people who were coming forward because they didn't know where the country was going to go and they wanted to land on their feet. And some of them just wanted to get things off their shoulders and some of them wanted to brag about things they never got credit for. And so it was a, it was a, it was an amazing time. So my dissertation came out in uh, 1994, and no one from the FBI was interested in it. I thought, it's a real insider look at this like no one's had. So finally, I, I got a I got a call um, from a senior FBI counterintelligence agent who wanted to meet. So we met many times over the years. And he, when I was a journalist, he was providing me with a lot of material, highly, highly, highly classified material that I had no business having. And I never did anything with it. I never wrote about it. He just wanted to know, you know, could I keep a secret? But okay, I think I've passed the test. But that guy was Robert Hanson. <laughs> so did you have any inkling he was bad, having met him so many times and he's giving you this? Because, you know... 
in your no, heart? No, not at all. I, I, he was a conservative. He was a rock-ribbed conservative, anti-communist. You would think that would be the last person who would be a traitor. But if, so that means all of us have to. We cannot be blind to the fact that the Russians and the Chinese communists and others they're going to, they're targeting all of us, no matter what we believe in especially in election years, right? But if they're doing a deep penetration of the FBI to get an anti-communist like Robert Hansen, who rises up as an intelligence agent, to get people like him in the FBI, then they can operate with impunity and with total destruction. Wow. Uh, So I never suspected him, but he was kind of quirky. But then so were a lot of people in counterintelligence. Some of the quirkiest people are the best. Uh, Well, what are we missing? Well, it it takes quirkiness to really succeed because because how can you survive a bureaucracy if you're a go along to get along kind of guy? You'll survive in it, but but you're not going to be doing your maximum to be creative because you you know it's a bureaucracy. Whereas a guy like Hanson on the outside was very cautious and, and very quiet. He was a subtle, quiet guy. He was a nice guy, but he was kind of off and I couldn't tell what it was, but okay, fine. He's a little bit off. I mean, everybody has some sort of off in some kind of way. So, but when he was arrested, I heard on the radio and I was surprised, but I wasn't shocked. That's the weird part. Why wasn't I shocked? And it might have been because, well, if the FBI is going to bust one of its own as a spy, it's probably known for a while. And they, I mean, they're not going to sully the reputation of the Bureau by branding one of their own people carelessly as a spy. So it had to be true. Well, and do you think he was grooming you, obviously, by giving you that the classified? I mean, that's shocking in itself. Yes, and I think even the worst part of that was uh, that... After he was arrested, I went to the FBI six times to offer their damage assessment team everything I knew, including the decrypted documents that he sent me that were on my computer, so that the FBI would know what had been compromised. So if he told me, who else did he tell? And how would the FBI know that I didn't reveal it to anybody? So I said, I want to sit down and go through all of this with you. They were not interested in my laptop. They sent wow. two teams of agents to talk to me about specific issues. But I said, here, you want my laptop? And they said, no. And then on one issue, when I said what I knew, they, they looked at each other and said that they're not cleared to know what I know. <laughs> I, just... I don't have a clearance, you know. But somebody, so anyway, so there was never an interest in that. And then another thing, too, where you have to have psychology, the right psychology as an FBI agent, you know, think of when the mentality inside a bureau gets such that you become, you cannot accept certain types of facts because that goes against the prevailing social trends. I don't like that. This is, it, yeah, yeah, this is right when politically correct was the thing before woke, but they were two young um, agents. They they were seemed like good agents. They were young women. And and I understood, but, but didn't know for a fact, but I understood that they were working directly with Hanson in prison to try to get him to talk. Mm. And I said to them, first, you know, nothing against you, but Hanson doesn't respect women, and he he won't respect you. He'll play games with you. So what you should do is get a couple of old-timers in there, some old-school retired guys who served under J. Edgar Hoover and busted up some real counter-espionage cases. And you might get a lot more out of Hanson that way. Well, I was told that that was never done because that would be sexist. Oh, my gosh. So, so just, just a quick one, Mike, because you've, you've been out in the field and, and understand, you know, human in, intel and everything. Do, do you think that, it, that the system today where, where you have all these analysts and stuff, we, we don't seem to do human intel anymore on the ground. It's all all analysis by, you know, computer stuff and 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 uh you know people sitting in a cubicle somewhere you know looking at a looking at a spy photo or or reading a paper you know or something and, and it, it just seems that we 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 lack the curiosity that that you really need to get in there to find out what's going on in, in a lot of cases is that is that just something that the nature of what we've become you know everything's politically correct now 
Yes, it's politically correct, and we have um, we rely too much on technology. Well, first, the technology we have is amazing technology, but we it's not everything. So you you really need to know people, and you really need to know individuals, and you really need to rely on people from other countries who know the culture. But in so doing, your own people need to know the culture without being part of the culture to the point they have families there where they might have a dual loyalty problem. So, so because of the way the, the system is built with careerism and you're rotating in and out of countries, if you're an intelligence officer or a diplomat, you can't stay and build the expertise and the personal networks that the way the British did when they were so successful. So you can't have somebody move to, say, Morocco, live there all his life running a business, get to know everybody, speak the local dialect, get to know the families of everybody. And, and just be that person who, who the go-to person who's collecting all this and building these lifelong relationships because that's not how the bureaucratic machine works. You always have to be rotated through and then you always have to hit certain benchmarks in order to get promoted. And there's even more box checking now where in the FBI, uh, as Steve Friend, a special agent who was in the Jacksonville office, as he has shown, they have a whole new matrix for for um, what you need to do, what, if, what every field office needs to do. So it needs to do so many, it needs to bust down so many doors. So you can literally knock on somebody's door and send, you know, make a deal with somebody's lawyer, but no, you have to bust down a certain number of doors every quarter or every year for the special agent in charge to get his bonus, literally. You have to do a certain number of wiretaps every quarter or every year, when oftentimes, most people are happy to talk to the FBI, or they were until recently. So, so no, why, why, you know, why call somebody on the phone when you can wiretap them, and then that goes <laughs> on your check yeah, box, and then the special agent in charge gets his bonus. So it's become crazy to to be this box checking exercise for for really only the purpose of not assessing uh, effectiveness, but for the purpose of determining who gets promoted and who gets their bonuses. That's awful. So, so what does the twenty twenty four election mean to you? Uh, you know, you're you've. I, I mean, I'm just so concerned because the FBI and the CIA they seem messed up to me. It needs to be fixed. If we don't get Trump in there, you know, is that even possible? Well, first, and this drives certain people nuts because they say if they were if this was true, then things would be different. There are a lot of really fine people in the FBI and the CIA, and they're really doing their jobs, or they would do their jobs if they were allowed to. And they're there, and, and for as long as they're there, you know that there's hope for those institutions. The problem is that the recruitment since Obama has been going for for the, the uh, liberal left and now woke. So go to, go to at FBI jobs on Twitter, and you see the woke recruitment ads that they're running yep the dei stuff kill, killing everything yeah. exactly and the, like the military and like like the cia too but not not as overtly so they're looking to populate the whole bureau or the whole agency with woke lunatics now if you subscribe to dei then you don't believe in 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 the good things about the founding of our country so the founders of our country are racist sexist christian men and they want to repress us. And then our whole constitutional system is racist and, and sexist and white controlled, you know, means of keeping dominance. So it's bad. So let's consider it as a living document that we can interpret however we wish. See, that way they're not overthrowing the Constitution, which is a crime. They're subverting the Constitution, which is not a crime. So, there, so there's a recruitment of people who think this way. And that we that, that the the fight is against ourselves more than it's against foreign adversaries and foreign enemies. So you have then sworn law enforcement officers and intelligence officers and analysts who think the United States is fundamentally a bad country. What are they defending? Why would we want them there? So they're populating from below, and as they have been since it actually began under Bush just by happenstance when he was expanding everything after 9-11. The Obama people come in. He puts leaders in there then at the top to pull up and to elevate through the central nervous system of the management system, 
to elevate these woke DEI critical theory type people. And so they're now they're running the whole nervous system of the CIA and the FBI. Trump didn't understand the problem, and he thought, well, I'll just peel off the top, you know, two or three levels, like he did with with uh, Comey and McCabe and Peter Strzok, and then and then everybody will jump into the line. Well, that's not how it works. So it really continued under Trump, and then through four years of Biden. So now we'll have had sixteen years of this. Sixteen years is more than halfway through a government employee's professional career. So their mid-level career is now when they when they join this junior level one. They're going to be senior level in the next administration, which means the whole institutions are going to be completely captured, and there won't be an ability to make change unless we have a new president this year who wants to do it. And if Donald Trump is elected, he has to have a real plan, not a slogan. Well, real he, plan. He, as, if you're, as if you're executing a military operation. Well, I think the, the plan is in Big Intel by J. Michael Waller, and you can find the book on Amazon.com. And we've kept you over. I, I owe you a bourbon or a beer when I'm in D.C. because the book is amazing, and I, and we got to have you back because, wow, I, I mean, honestly – You've been able to, you know, live the dream on your on your own, you know, working in these intel and, and everything that you do writing. And so the book is brilliant, Mike. Well, thank you. And Veronica and John, it's been great uh, being with both of you. And obviously, there's a lot more that's not in the book, uh, but it was just it's just a start. And to get a national discussion, because it's easy to lift up our hands in despair. But no, the sheriffs can do a lot at the local level. And, and uh, the right president can do a lot at the top. And when you have them both working together, we can help fix this mess. Well, we will have you back. And we want everybody, J. Michael Waller. The book is called Big Intel, How the CIA and FBI Went from Cold War Heroes to Deep State Villains. Thanks, Mike, for coming on Veronica Live. Thank you. And we'll, Thank be, you we'll be right back. Welcome back to Veronica Live. And oh my gosh, John, we, we kept our last guest, uh, Mr. Counterintelligence Expert, over because he was so incredible and uh, kind of a living legend. You know, I, I've got to meet his mother that let him run off to Nicaragua and Honduras because <laughs> I, I would have been like, what spring break is down there, son? You know, with the well, contrast. Well, this was a guy who was in the middle of all of it, you know, during oh the Reagan gosh, stuff with, with uh, you know, Oliver North and all that. I mean, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on. Pre, so pre this, social media and texting. And can you even imagine? And yep. and he met that the Hanson, who's like the ultimate awful spy. And he was alluding yep. to that. He was always, I guess, a communist, you know. Yeah. Um, so, no, I, I owe him bourbon. And when I fly to D.C. next time, I'm I've got to meet him because, you know, when you meet people and there's alcohol involved, the stories are better. <laughs> <laughs> joking, of course, joking. Yeah. But you were just telling me off air that you went to Publix. So I went to Publix Thursday. Yeah. Thursday was my first outing because I had to go back to the doctor because, you know, I'm a walking adult toddler with a double ear infection sinus infection plus i'd been on steroids and i kept asking my husband i was like can you make me like a standing rib roast because like steroids <laughs> makes me like i am not a vegetarian wanna, on wanna steroids. Eat. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and the dogs me, are like me. stop eating our leg you know uh, but I went into I went into Publix that day and I it was it was I shouldn't have gone because I bought like every carb known to man and um and for example the English muffins were it was buy one get one but John they're normally six ninety seven for six stupid English muffins and so so I was already scandalized but it was buy one get one so I was like okay and now I'm gonna have English muffins for days I can invite the king of England over. And and then I went to the meat section in the hunt of my my standing rib roast, which are they don't exist when it's not English or, or uh, Easter and Christmas. A pot roast, John, a stupid pot roast that you have to cook in a in a crock pot for literally eight hours to make it you know amazing. Twenty nine dollars, twenty nine dollars. Is it isn't it crazy? You know, I mean, we we bought for for our Christmas dinner. We had a uh, a uh, prime rib and and it was only like i don't know five pounds or something 
a hundred dollars. Well, that's was, when Publix floored. will be on sale for that one. Yeah. But you were talking yeah. about the soda prices, and I learned oh, that soda, when I had my New Year's I, Eve party. I, I know. I almost fell out. Yes, I guess I was in Publix yes, yesterday or the day before, and and I was, you know, it was like buy two get one free. Yeah. And I'm looking at the shelf price, and it's like ten dollars for one twelve pack. I, and I'm I, like, well, what? and in ten dollars <laughs> for a twelve pack. I know because I I don't normally buy price. the soda because I like it only out of a fountain because I'm a fountain snob, but. I was yeah. scandalized when I was buying some for for the my New Year's Eve party, and uh, you know, and then Biden this week came out and was like, "We have to bring oh. the prices down." And it doesn't matter. Yes, Publix <laughs> Publix is more expensive. Yes, but it's the same. We have like this little grocery outlet near my house, and and everything is is expensive now. Everything. So I I, I feel for the the you know the the young couple or single person that. You know, I, which I will say this past like year, two years, I've met multiple people that have multiple jobs because they can't get health insurance on one and they're trying to make it, John, you know, working 20 hours here, 20 hours there. And, and then they have to $10. Who's buying soda? Exactly. You know, even, even, even me, I'm looking at it and it's like, I think I'm just going to make me a, you know, a pot of iced tea and forget the soda, <laughs> you know, because. I'm, I, it gets to the point where you sit there and say, I'm I'm not going to pay $10 for a case of soda. I, Hell I, no. I don't need it that bad. And then you they know, make not... you do math, buy two, get one free. And I'm like, uh, uh, how do I do that word problem? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like even buying <laughs> buying two and getting two free still wouldn't Especially be a Especially on some like, you know, day, it, day you know? Quill. I You know, it's not possible. I can't do oh, math it's... on day Quill. And there's been a lot of day well, Quill lately. <laughs> <laughs> well, my my problem is I I remember when you could actually get get stuff for a reasonable price. Yeah. Okay, and, but uh, but since when are six English muffins six ninety seven? Exactly. Or a you loaf know, of bread five dollars. Five dollars. What the was, hell? Yeah. Even egg prices are going going back up. You know, I think they were three something, three fifty for a dozen eggs again. You, you know, it's just. It, Either the, the dot well it is the dollar is worthless you know the dollar because they're spending so much money they're printing so much money and and at some point as they say the chickens come home to roost and we're seeing it in the prices you know Bidenflation is real but this week he was he was like begging Pete retailers to bring it down <laughs> uh, yeah. you know when he when he and, and it, does say something of relevance but it, it's stupid it's like it's not like it's not like you know, Publix is making a and and Win Dixie. You know that these that these grocery companies are all, you know, just making you know money hand over fist on it. It, it that's not the case. You know, they're they're still struggling. You know, to to make you know it's a it's a low margin business. You know, they make one or two percent. It's cutthroat competition. You know, if you don't like Publix prices, go to go to Win Dixie, go to Piggly Wiggly. You know, go wherever. You know, there there's lots of competition out there. So it's not like it's not like it's a monopoly where you can sit there and 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 you know go go and uh, charge whatever you want you know and well, the same thing well, for gas you know ga- gas you know bought buying gas for the airplane the other day you know four dollars a gallon for for unleaded unleaded gas you know and I'm just shaking my head say four dollars they're gonna be back to five dollars here shortly. What what was funny, because the story is, you know, the Biden administration uh, asked companies to lower prices on goods from milk to eggs and bread. And (laughs) their quote is, our message is very clear, clear one that the president and will continue to he'll continue to lean into, which is if your company whose input prices have come down and you're not passing those savings along to the consumer, he's going to call you out, John. So well, six ninety seven uh, for for yeah, English milk's muffins. A milk's a funny one because most milk prices are controlled by the government. Well, <laughs> there's a floor price on milk. That the it was so set. funny because um, my husband, you know, he does a lot of cooking, so he made like the Kemeny, uh was pork chops, and you put like uh, uh, always that that lovely can of you know mushroom soup, and so he mm-hmm. actually got it at the cheaper grocery store and. He commented that it used to be a do- like ninety nine cents, and now it's a dollar fifty within yep. the last year. You know, and and I can afford to buy the dollar fifty. I'm always looking for the deal, but but how is every you know the, these people that are on the cusp of not making it? How are they make you know? How are they making it? And th- and that brings me to the story. I texted you this story 
Um, the mayor, New York, is giving 53, they plan to give $53 million to illegals in New York City in prepaid debit cards uh, <laughs> to migrants suspend in bodegas. Users must sign an affidavit, uh, affidavit promising only to use the cards for food <laughs> and baby supplies. So a family of four will get 1000 a month. And, uh, I mean, is this not insanity? I mean, granted, I always say this, I feel for four people. And this is a pilot program of 500 families. And uh, they're going to, so they get 1000 a month. It's like $35 a day. Once again, who's helping the Americans? I don't know if you heard this story. It's in um, Roxbury, Massachusetts. They have like a, it's kind of a YMCA, you can swim, gym, kids go there after school in this poor neighborhood to do homework, and the mayor took it over. She took it over and put, it's all for illegals, and she said they're only going to be there till June, and so they had this man in the soundbite I heard, it was a black man, older man, coming to where he comes to hang out, sir, you can't come in, we've got other people, and then he starts the beep. Beep, 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 beep. You know, he's like, so where's he supposed to go? Right. It's winter well, in Massachusetts. This is where he goes. He can't even go. Where's he going, John? Now you've well, taken. And what about these kids that are barely making it single parent? This is where they go to do homework, hang out, play some b ball. And I mean, no offense to the illegals. No offense. But uh, it's getting ridiculous now that we're harming uh, our, uh, our own people. Well, I. I I, I won't say no offense to the the illegals. I don't care about the illegals. The, the, the first the key word is illegal. Okay, they shouldn't be here. Let's start with that part, and and to see what's going on in these in these big cities. You know, with not even and it's not just the Northeast. You know, I'll give you a good example. Atlanta the story broke this week about Atlanta Airport. Apparently, oh, there's yeah. a section of Atlanta Airport that is off limits to anybody but illegals. Because they're running a human trafficking operation through there where they're running the illegals into Atlanta Airport, putting them in this access-only section that nobody else can get into, including, by the way, a Georgia state senator that tried to get in there, and they wouldn't let him in. Now, this is a public airport in the state of Georgia, and they're telling a state senator he has no authorization to go into this area where there's it's exclusively for illegals and what they're doing is they're flying they they, apparently they take the illegals they store them in there and then at the last minute when there's a flight going somewhere the government buys the ticket puts this illegal on the airplane or their family or however many of them on there and jets them off different parts of the country no security checks okay no identification you try getting into the airport and on an airplane without an id in this country well, you we can can't. If you're an illegal. If you're an illegal, you can do it. The government will put you on there. The government has no idea who you are, and, and they're 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 running these gang people all over the all over the country. You, you saw it in New York this week, right? You had this this illegal bunch of illegals beat down two cops. And right. Guess right. What? They were free on they were free on bail within an hour. Walking out the door. Well, and, and they're and, saying and, that and half of them have, or more than half have. They're on a already left to California. Yeah, going to Cali. To Cali. You know, yeah. and now and now the so, New York governor's trying to be tough, saying, "Oh yeah, we should, you know, export them." <laughs> yeah, well, but talk but when you see the video, I saw some analysis on it. The cops, like these kids, were like going for their weapons, and the cops yes. are trying to not pull out their weapons because they're you know everybody's afraid now to to do the right thing. So yeah, it was it was awful, totally it, awful. It, it, it is, and and it you know, to me until you start until you start, maybe the violence requires violence. Uh, you know, as I would I would back the cop that pulled out his gun and shot every one of these jerks. Well, they I, talked I about no their problem. their. I, I, know, I know that's not not politically correct to say that, Veronica, but I have it. It's that's the level it's going to take because you have to send a message. Okay, you have to send a clear, distinct message that people understand. And when you start shooting people dead. You know, as, as bad as that sounds, if that's what it takes to restore a civil society back to order, then then that's what you have to do. Look at history, okay? Look at the history of the world, and you'll see that that's, you know, when you let, and what we're doing is we're letting all this violence, there's no consequences for violent behavior. The, 
Gavin Newsom, big story this week, right? You saw it in the stack of stuff. Gavin oh, yeah, Newsom's at in Target. A, in, in a, at a <laughs> Target, right? And, and, and watches these people walk out the door with three or four or $500 worth of stuff and not pay, and he asked the clerk, well, aren't you going to stop them? And the clerk's like, well, the governor says we can't. And, of course, the clerk didn't realize that was the governor standing in front of her, you know. So, so Gavin Newsom gets all righteous on her. Well, you know, I, I just worry that the woman is probably going to lose her job, you know, of course because she didn't know who job. she was. Um, it, didn't, it shouldn't matter. Who, it, it shouldn't matter who he was and, and what should what his response. See, he had a self-centered response. It's like you're blaming the governor. I'm the governor, you know, so you're you're wrong, you know. So where's your manager? Because I'm going to I'm going to school your manager. Well, and that's what the story said. It's, it said it's unknown if Newsom's going full Karen and and ratting the woman out to her manager um, and getting her fired. And I I hope the woman's not fired because where's the police at to come arrest these people. And it's like, well, the police aren't going to arrest them. And it's like, why? But back to those kids in New York, those Venice, they were Venezuelan. And apparently they've, they've had so many, so many uh, incidents of shoplifting and, you know, and then they're out. Nothing happens. Nothing happens, Sean. Yeah. And, you know, I had this discussion the other day. I, I got really infuriated because when I was a second lieutenant, I moved to Panama, the country, after Operation Just Cause. There was no families. And it was a banana republic. Somebody at one point during my two years hit me. Their fault. And what did the base legal tell me? They're like, you just need to say, you know, you, you don't say anything because no matter what, they're going to blame you. I couldn't even defend myself in a, banana, in a banana republic. And I didn't even cause the accident. And so, you know, the insurance ended up paying for it. So, and it was like things after that, you know, flying to Hong Kong with a bunch of ladies on this trip when I lived in Japan. And they're like, oh, we've got to get through their customs, but he's going to ask you to pay $50. And who did he single out? He grabbed all the American women. And we all had to pay $50 to get our suitcase. It was just banana republic. And we're becoming that. Plus, these people will kill you. They'll kill you. We don't right. know who they are. They're saying they're MS whatever. And now we have Venezuelan gangs in Miami, too. So well, well that's what, I, what that was one of the things I I'd not not heard before until this week was apparently these these different immigrant groups the Nicaraguans the Guatemalans you know the Panamanians yeah. they're all forming country related gangs yeah. in these in these big cities so they're and and they're fighting each other okay it's not it's not just war on And on, guess who's going to be in the middle for the Americans it, it's gang on gang violence which which you know they're there, you know, the Crips and the Bloods have been around a long time. Law enforcement is very familiar with with gang violence and how to and how to counter it. The problem is they can't counter it anymore because they can't find a district attorney that's but, willing but to. But do you think the people. Crips and the Bloods? I don't. I think they took out each other. They didn't try to take out you or me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, they were. They were. You know, I I think I think the mindset of these these new gangs is completely different than than what we would be looking at in that case. And and, you know, and, and the fact that we're going to be giving giving all this money, you know, these cards and stuff to all these illegal. Fifty three million. Next, yeah, what do you think the next thing is going to happen when when the gang people know these 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 miscreants that don't care about the law? OK, remember, remember, they're all illegals. They don't care about the law. OK, they've already well, broken the law. To I think they yeah, I they heard somebody say trouble. they've broken three laws by the time they get to right. where they're going. Right. So they, they have no problem with law breaking. OK, they have no respect for the U.S. law. We're just we're just a money. We're an ATM machine to these people. That's all we are. We are an ATM machine to the world. And that's why they're all coming here because they can get stuff for free. They can get free housing. They can get free food. You know, get all the free peanut butter and jelly sandwiches they want, although they don't probably have a clue what the hell a peanut butter and jelly sandwich is. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds good when you're sick, a PB&J. <laughs> uh, yeah. Do they have, do they have uh, you know, put, put a taco PB&J? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> no. Well, I, again, I feel for the people, but this is making we us a banana republic where when are we going to stand up when are I don't we going to say enough and then what if enough. those cops have been killed and they have a family too you know what i'm saying who who's well, fighting for them well you know in, in some cases i'm 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 fine with saying let the big cities rot in hell because these people are vote that remember these are all representatives they've been elected to their offices by the people of that city so at some point you got to put the responsibility on the on the people that vote for them, 
that's the bottom line. It's the people that vote for them. You, you know, you, you get chaos and crazy, but people voted for chaos and crazy. And until it gets bad enough, until it gets until it gets in your front yard or until it, the bullets start flying through your house or or somebody in your family gets killed, then maybe you'll have a different perspective. But well, they keep well, and, and I, in. I mean, I definitely Bragg I, didn't didn't go in with a gun to take over that office as, as a prosecutor. OK, he got elected. Kathy Hochul, she got elected. They could have had, they could have had uh, Lee Zeldin. Oh, he as was so governor. nice and right? so good. Right, oh, great my gosh. governor. Yeah, great he Republican, would have been great. Constitutional guy, right? They could have had him. Their choice was her. Well, and so if she brings chaos, then they deserve the chaos. I, I don't brings. want chaos because it impacts you and me, and you know, well, and the at, fentanyl at the that's the everywhere, day, and people dying, and it just, it's just—it's it, when are we going to wake up, America? Twenty twenty four is more critical than ever. So I, I'm going to be I, on I, my soapbox every I day. Know, but I, I I think it's going to come down. You know, we're, we're fortunate that we live here, where we have a sheriff that gives a damn. That's not going to let this crap metastasize, okay? So I don't, I don't have to sit here and, and say, well, I, you know, you come and you come and try and rob me, I'm going to shoot you, okay? And it's like the sheriff's going to say, you know, great job, make sure you aim carefully, <laughs> you know. And and I, I, I heard that from a a uh, when we back in the day when you had when you concealed carry, you had to go get your your NRA certificate, you know, for for concealed carry training. And and that was one of the questions that came up is that well do you got to make sure the burglar falls inside the door <laughs> when you shoot him or drag him and, in the house my dad right, would and, say and a, and a, form, a former <laughs> that a was former when we lived in Virginia <laughs> yeah a, a former a former sheriff's deputy said said no you don't need to worry about that around here if you think you got to shoot him shoot him and it's probably justifiable you know right right he doesn't have to fall inside your house you know that's not the standard. Well, well, uh, the other story that was in our afterburner stack I have to talk about with you is Ron DeSantis' spokesperson ripped our new chairman, Evan Power, before he canceled a Laura Loomer interview. <laughs> so so what did we say? We, we like, you know, because I was trying to help Peter Feynman, yeah, Pete, who's Peter, our national Peter committee right man, select, right, and not controlled by anybody. And yeah. and so, you know, I, I witnessed history that day. Evan Evan's lovely. He's been on the show. He's great. But this was what I was afraid of. And here we go. So um, and, and it, so anyways, it says that after Evan Power agreed to go on. Laura, so this is he was going on the, the show, not even Governor DeSantis. Evan right. Power agreed to go on Laura Loomer's program, multiple mouthpieces for Ron DeSantis spoke out. They amplified concerns after months of slashing attacks from the conservative commentator who ardently supports Donald Trump. And and so a poster to X chided power saying, you're seriously going on a platform of a lunatic who said Casey DeSantis faked her cancer and said some of the most despicable things I've ever heard about our favorite governor, Ron DeSantis. This is not r the right move for you or the Florida GOP. And then it continued, agreed, asserted former press secretary Brian Griffin, who most recently was part of the governor's now suspended presidential campaign. And then this one too, disappointing, asserted former spokesperson Christina Peshaw, who most recently handled rapid response for the same campaign. And then and, and she and she she is a smart operator. You know, I don't know if how Oh, well she's you fun follow to follow her. her on Twitter. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. She she's spot on. She was spot on. Well, but, and but then right. and then Evan says it's a little comical. We're the party that against cancel culture is spreading the ways Florida's leading the way in the fight of our country is wrong. What are we doing here? And then um, he, re he refused to let echo chambers define the good work we're doing. And then he canceled the interview. So he caved saying he had another commitment. And then Lou Loomer went postal. <laughs> she wrote, I'll continue to go scorched earth on all enemies of trump especially now that it's interfered with my show wasted my time guess i'll need to inform all my viewers tonight how ron DeSantis is now torturously interfering in the show of pro trump floridians <laughs> there you go evan power uh, he he caved i wouldn't have caved i'm like sorry uh, well, well first off if, if he if he really believed what he believed he should have went on and and made his case 
the the problem is uh, Veronica I I don't think he could have made the case okay Peter would have been fine on that yeah, but show. make he the been... case of what even though this weekend it's the RPOF because I saw you well, posted they're all together deciding right, you, you could... who to endorse you know all right so so as as political party leaders okay <laughs> you know as a former member of R- RPOF for 12 years okay in the leadership we get a lot of training okay and, and one of the one of the best sessions I ever had was how to handle interviews okay we actually got training from from <laughs> people that that are pros on this and, and i'm an and, expert as you know <laughs> right, and they explain expert. to you all the, all the traps to look yeah for because yeah. you know the first one is if a reporter calls you out of the blue they've already written the story and they're calling you for confirmation okay they don't want to have a discussion they're calling you to confirm their storyline so you have to listen keyword listen to what they're saying try to discern what their storyline is and then turn it around on them so so you, you have to be quick on your feet in these kind of situations. And I just don't think Evan is is there. He's not the person. Peter could handle it. Well, I don't I mean Evan's been, been on our so show. Long. I mean he's definitely right. I, I think he could have handled it. Well, he, well, he, I'm just he, mad he, he, he didn't go on. Right, but Peter's a lawyer and he thinks like well, a lawyer. Yes. Okay? He so definitely would have crushed it. Right. He listens for the question. He listens. He tries to understand context and and then and, and reframe it. Evan is a lobbyist, okay? <laughs> His job is is to talk. Yeah, but but what is the the bottom line is this is what I was worried about. I don't want the chairman right. of the RPOF to be controlled by anyone because we haven't gone through the primary yet. So, I I'm 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 ticked. The story like inflamed me. Well, the, you know, it was obvious that, that the governor stacked stacked the deck to get Evan elected okay he, he his governor appointees that weren't going to vote for evan he replaced them with people who would vote for evan so he did everything no, I, I witnessed it he it, it was to, right. absolutely he horrific he act, actively it, worked to get evan elected and and that's his prerogative he's the governor of the state of florida he's the titular head of of the republican party of florida okay I, i've given that that's that he got elected fair and square well, and I'm, it, I'm mad. If you want Evan in as as a leader, then then he gets Evan as his leader. Uh, but but uh, y- you know, and, and RPF has gone against the governor before. RPF went against Governor Scott. Oh, I they remember. Paid, they and... paid the price. They paid the price for not electing Leslie Dewar. Who, who I remember. I was at chairman. that election too. Right, right. So so I remember that. I mean, it's like, and they paid a price because the governor did nothing. Nothing to do any fundraising for for the Republican Party of Florida as an organization. Not a thing. Well, and and, it, and, and that that's what they should have expected. You know, the the Senate they the Senate pulled their leadership money, and only the House stuck stuck with RPOF with their well, leadership. It, well, money. this is what I didn't want, and it's just happened. And we're talking like what three four weeks after the election. So right. Uh, the other the other. T- Did you expect a better outcome? I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I I live in a fantasy world. I've decided, John. <laughs> I, I live in I live in real as as, as Rush used to say. I live in Realville. <laughs> Realville. I, I I I see I see the world for what it is now, uh, and and it, I'm sad. I am so sad in, well, in so many it, cases. It, it, it's it's all about your bank account, and then you know. And then term limits. I I freaking want term limits now because I've seen too much bloody stuff. You know, I, I, I'm trying to. There was there was a song years ago that was a very popular hit, uh, and it was about it was about the evolution of mankind through time. It was like in the in the year twenty twenty five twenty five or something. But anyway, the, the song talks it, you know uh, over years about how how man progresses and keeps going morally backwards and then at the end you know in, in ten thousand years from now god says man's had his run we're done <laughs> <laughs> and on that note it, i, I want to talk about your political car- cartoons in the afterburner and um yeah. one of them has uh, it's got president biden with red paint and the paint the paint bucket says don't and then he keeps drawing <laughs> a red line 
And it says Biden's red line. And then he, draw, you know, it has a bomb. Then it draws another red line and a bomb. And then, uh, you know, we're at 166. And six days later, after three Americans killed. I, I mean, how embarrassing is this whole thing? I, I well, nailed it. Nailed it. Yeah, exactly. He's backed himself into a corner is is what he's done, you know. And, and it shows another, another drone with another bomb coming at him <laughs> while he's drawing another red line. Uh, you, you oh, know. and then the other one is the the lovely congresswoman who is a freaking <laughs> communist, Elon Omar, and she's wearing her her ethnic turban. Her, I don't know turban. what it's, is it a turban? Her her head uh, well, well a head ethnic dress, headdress. Whatever. I don't know the yeah. proper word. I don't want to offend anyone. And it says make Somalia great again. <laughs> and this week she gave a speech all in Somali all pro her country and nothing to do with America. And literally they, you know, there was all kinds of translations of this horrific speech. And this woman is a traitor. And then, you know, I, I was thinking about it. I almost miss George Santos with his Botox and, <laughs> you know, Prada shopping because at least we knew he was an American. You know what I'm saying? All, all, right. all, all he was doing was, was lying about his resume. Okay. That's all he was doing. <laughs> but he, you know, he wasn't actually out trying to support, you know, the uh, enemy. another country uh, uh, over, over the United States, you know, and, and putting Somalia first as opposed to the United States first. Can you I, I even mean, believe this? And that she would even have I, the cojones to think that nobody would translate her dumb speech. Well, well, here's here's the problem, Veronica. And this is this is what what we have to look forward to. She is from a district that is basically a Muslim district, and, and this, this kind of goes back it's to it's not another, a, an anti-Muslim thing here. This is about being an no, American no, it, when you come to America. Well, why, yeah, I understand it, but the problem is you have you have these these different ethnic groups coming into the country and settling in communities. Okay. And unlike unlike the the early 1900s when we had all this immigration from Europe, you know, where you had the Italian community, you had the German community. You know, it's like it's like in Philadelphia, you've got Germantown. You know, well, <laughs> the reason it's named Germantown, okay? But you know, you had a you had an Italian section of, of Philadelphia, and and yes, it was an Italian section, but they all wanted to be Americans, okay? They all believed in the melting pot thing, and they all wanted to be Americans. Yeah. They remember the old country, but they also knew they no, were in No, America my mother was from Spain as and right. only spoke English in my house. She didn't want to right. be bilingual, which I'm mad about, right. you know, because right. I had to work to be bilingual, and I have a horrific accent because of it. Right, but but these people have no interest in, in learning English. The, the all these immigrants coming in that speak Spanish, they have no interest in learning English. They want to speak Spanish. They're forming communities. Hell, in Texas, they are building communities, new homes, building communities designed just for these immigrants to go into, and where the entire population is is the the immigrants from from Guatemala or Nicaragua or whatever. That's what it's being designed for. So so the mentality is not going to be America. It's going to be Hey, we're all Nicaraguans. Let's let's act like we're in Nicaragua or no, Guatemala no. or whatever. No, and, 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 and we're not going to learn English. We're you know we're going to go to a school and and we're going to make sure the school system you know speaks Spanish, not not English. No, you know? English, and, and that is not assimilation. Okay, no, it's America's not. America's secret has always been assimilation. That's always well, been the melting pot and, idea. And my whole family, you know, my father in law was Hungarian, my mother in law Scottish, my mother Spanish. They embraced it, you know what I'm saying, and being yep. an American yep. and loved America. Um, the only one that's standing up and kicking ass like she always does, it's in Business Insider, Marjorie Taylor Greene, is trying to boot yep. lovely Ilian Omar from her <laughs> committees. And the, and the headline says, over misquoted remarks about Somalia. And um, so she's trying, you know, she's tried to censor, censor her before. I mean, I'm sorry, this well, woman they, needs to go. Bring me George Santos back. Bring me George right. back. They, they tried to get her on the anti-Semitism. You know, they wouldn't. They didn't even have the the cojones to 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 censor her on 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 her anti-Israeli comments. You know, or, or anti-Jewish comments. You know, for they, they couldn't even bring themselves to do that. The the best one I heard was deport her back to Somalia. Her and her she, she, brother husband. Yeah, <laughs> which she wouldn't make it. She wouldn't make it because um, she had to marry marry her brother. So her husband, her as her husband, so he could stay in the country and not get deported or something. It's a, it's the most bizarre story. Back to the culture though, where she's 
at from 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 Minnesota is is this this district where where it's 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 all people well, well all, but and, and a lot of people from Somalia and they all they all that's why that's how she gets elected. And Governor De- DeSantis said um, that Omar needed to be expelled from Congress, naturalized, and deported. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so I do like his comment on that. I have to say that was that was good. But but uh, well, what are we missing? I mean, it's just it's, you know, I, we we've covered it all. I, I my well, our hearts and prayers go out to the three soldiers' families, you know, that were killed, and may they rest in peace. Uh, the whole thing's so sad. And what's next? You know, are we going to war because of all this stupidity with Iran? I hope not, John. Well. At the end of the day, when you just keep, you know, as, as the cartoon shows with, with Biden painting himself into a corner with the other, it's not Biden, it's, it's Biden painting himself into a corner. He's painting the country, the U.S. into a corner. And and if Donald Trump gets elected later on in the year, he's going to have to deal with this. Well, I mean, that's all I, he's going to have so much to deal with, with that. And I know so, that. So, there's a so know, website out Trump. there that's collecting resumes because he's trying to be ready, you know. So right, right, but the thing is, is, is back to how do you fix it? Okay, you've let it go this far, so so now they've got this idea they can push, 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 and it's like, is is Donald Trump going to have to demonstrate to these people that you don't push us? Is he going to have to go in there, the shock and awe campaign? I mean, shock and awe, like destroy every bit of their nuclear. Yeah, but are we even capable with fabricate? these wimpy wimpy generals? I, I don't even think we are. Well, that's 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 where I would probably start. I would probably start with firing the generals. I would absolutely fire a lot of these political generals that are up there right now in, in the Pentagon and, and, and are, quote, leaders. You know, the problem is – this is a sad, sad thing. Obama purged all the warriors, okay? He got rid of them. He didn't want them around. He, he promoted the political guys, and, and, and as Mike was, was – was alluding to is the problem is you you've got a number of years that have passed the junior officers are now moving up into the senior leadership and and who's getting promoted the political people not the warriors Mm -hmm. and at some point at some point there's there's a line where you become go from you know somewhat good warrior to you know marginal politician and then and then to get further along you have to dump the warrior part and and increase the politician part I don't know if that's the 05 or 06 level, something somewhere in that in that region. But, uh, you know, you, you're not going to get you're not going to get a star if you're not political. I, that's just the bottom line. And and the, and the problem is I, I've talked I was actually talking to to one of my friends uh, this past week. You know, his his son uh, just got promoted to to a, a very high deputy position and they wanted him in that job, you know, enough to where they didn't make him move to Washington. And and, the, and I asked him, does, it, does that does that promotion bring a star with it? And he's like, it it probably does, but he him and his wife don't know if they want to make that commitment. I've met people that have turned down their stars now. I've yeah. met them the last couple of years because it's not because worth it, it. Right. If it takes it, if he takes it, he's going to Washington, and then he has and then he has a commit a time commitment. To go with it, and he, and they're just, you know, they've got teenage sons, and they don't want, they don't want the Washington D.C. environment. Right, right. So, well, know, he's, not, he's not a political, he's not a politically correct guy. Well, we've got to pray for our country. We've got to vote in twenty twenty four in November, and it, it counts more than ever. I mean, everything's messed up, and we got to thank our guest, Chairman Bob White. He's a Republican Li- Liberty Caucus uh, Florida Chairman, RLCFL dot org, and then J dot Michael Waller, f- uh, former operative for the CIA counterintelligence expert. His book was outstanding. Big Intel: How the CIA and FBI went from Cold War heroes to deep state. Villains. You can state villains. You can find it on Amazon.com. And I might need a therapist because I'm reading all these books and I don't know how to save the country. <laughs> Does anyone know a therapist? I've never been. <laughs> that, that's, that's the problem. You know, every we read about all the problems, but it's like, how do you? <laughs> How do you fix well, it? Well, his know? book how, how does do talk it? about how to break down the FBI and the CIA, which I'm sure I'm sure the daggers are coming out, you know, and it's 
it's moving moving things around and getting getting them under the right people but but john um i survived you know so <laughs> double ear infection couldn't hear a thing <laughs> All right, uh, and a uh, great show as usual and um oh my goodness did we save the world that's the question well, at, at least the world should hopefully be more aware of the problems, whether we've got the right <laughs> answers or not. I don't know, but it, you know, some, something's going to change sometime soon, okay? Because it just right. can't keep going on, you know? Well, we, we'll uh, catch us. The podcast will be out, and we'll have more, more guests for the next one, too. So check us out. We're on... We're on Spotify, iHeart, iTunes, Podcast Attic, YouTube now, LinkedIn. I share a lot of this uh, excellent interviews, True Social, and Twitter. So I don't think we have enough platforms. And if you want to sponsor Veronica <laughs> Live, let me know and follow us on all of our Facebook and Instagram as well, John. So great show, my wingman. Okay. Have a great week and uh, look forward to next week. All right. God bless everyone. Veronica Live out.